This week's episode of Astonishing Legends is brought to you by Blue Apron, The Great Courses Plus, and our contributors at Patreon.com. On March 15, 1939, after the signing of the Munich Pact, Germany was offered the keys to the kingdom to the majority of what is the modern-day Czech Republic. As a result, Hitler marched troops into Bohemia and Moravia and established a protectorate over Slovakia without having to fire a single shot. The Munich Pact was meant to appease Hitler by handing over the part of the country that three million ethnic Germans lived in. However, what Hitler got was more land and three quarters of the country's coal, iron, steel, and power, which could be put to good use for the Nazi war machine. In the middle of that newly acquired land, the Nazis commandeered four ancient castles in Sudetenland and proceeded to fill them with half a million confiscated books on the occult, witchcraft, and mysticism. The castles were known by their code names, Burgund I, Burgund II, Burgund III, and Burgund IV. This code name came from the SS ambition to turn the Burgundy region of France into a federal state and part of the German Empire, because they believed it to be a home of science and art before becoming simply a wine-producing area. However, Burgundy could also provide strategic access to the Mediterranean for Germany. Burgund II was none other than Castle Hoska, and it housed 98,356 volumes of occult books alone. Why were they collecting them, especially in a time when their official line was that those subjects were forbidden? <laughs> Welcome back to Astonishing Legends. I'm Scott Philbrook, and this is Forrest Burgess. How well I have learned that there is no fence to sit on between heaven and hell. There is a deep, wide gulf, a chasm, and in that chasm is no place for any man. Johnny Cash. Join us tonight for the final part of our in-depth series on the Czech Republic's Castle Hoska and the gateway to hell beneath it. And we're back. Did you, See, I toned that down. No, no. You should have heard me before uh, that we're not using here. Uh, that was your goofy, German? No, I'm not even close. Well, it had something in it. Just a little flavoring. Like the okay. Johnny Cash thing. Right, anyway, I, I can't, I would never dare try and do a Johnny Cash impression. I have too much respect for him. Yeah. Well, we are back and we got a lot to cover tonight, especially with regard to the Nazis in the castle. But before we do that, remember how we said last week we were going to talk to our friend Travis J. Dow, who actually lived in Prague for nine or ten years, I believe. You're yeah. going to find out here in a minute. We did manage to get him on the phone. He is part of the Bohemican podcast with his partner, Pete. They have a, an entire podcast all about this region. So why are you listening to us? <laughs> <laughs> although although uh, we did mention and have a link to his uh, episode on it for the webpage for this episode. But tonight, we're going to go right to the guy who's actually been there. Yeah. And he will answer your questions that have been... Uh, peppering into us. Yeah, we had a great conversation with him just a few days ago, and we thought that it would be great to get him on the phone and talk to him a little bit about Hoska since he's actually been there, and also to address some of the interesting questions that we've gotten from listeners in the intervening time since we released part one. So let's go to Travis. Hey, how's it going? It's very good. It's very good. Thank you so much for making the time to come on the show today. The Castle Hoska episode. First of all, I wouldn't have said Hoska right if you hadn't have told us how. It's uh, been Hoska, 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 Hoska. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> I really appreciate the advice on that. So why don't you just quickly tell our listeners a little bit about your shows and uh, what you do? All right. Well, uh, I'm Travis Dow, and the best way you can see all my shows is if you go to podcastnik.com. It's like podcastnik.com, like Sputnik. But I do, uh, History of Germany is probably the biggest one, and The Secret Cabinet, which I'm taking to the stage next year, Africa History, and then um, History of Alchemy and Bohemican are the two I started with, with uh, Pete Coleman, so which is most relevant for this show. Yeah, just go to podcastnik.com and 
check it out. If you don't remember, we had Travis J. Dow here on the phone with us for our Count of St. Germain episodes. That's right. Because he weighed in with a much more knowledgeable take on the count than we would have provided. But he was, it was very kind of you to do so. Fascinating topic anyways. And hey, it's an honor to be on the show. So anytime. Well, we're glad to have you all. And also, by the way, just for the sake of our audience, you speak multiple languages, right? I speak two officially. Okay. Because if I say any more than that, I'll get in trouble. Like my, my, <laughs> wife, my wife's Costa Rican. So in theory, you know, in theory, on paper, my Spanish is okay. But I mean, I understand a fair bit. Someone's like, oh, you speak Spanish? And they're like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, uh, <laughs> uh, un poco. And uh, my Czech, uh, I, I was a tour guide there. I've lived there for 10 years. And the thing is, Czechs will come up to me and in Czech, ask me if I was going to be a tour guide, I'd wear like a overcoat, like a trench coat and a World War One gas lantern and a top hat and an umbrella, you know, red umbrella so people recognize me. And um, oh, actually my employer, you talked to her on your last episode. Yes, that was, we did. I worked for McGee's Ghost Tours in Prague, so small world. I had no um, but, idea but of Czech, that, by the way, yeah, when Czech I reached out to her. Yeah, come up and ask me, like, uh, mluvite Czechy? And I'm like, nah, you know, something. And I, just the fact that I understood and said, no, I do not, or like, I do not understand Czech in Czech, they'd be like, ah, ha, ha, good one, and then start to speak Czech at me. <laughs> so I'd have to walk into a store and just be like, Dobry den, y'all. Yak uh, <laughs> If I would say, like, Dobry den, yak then they would answer in Czech and I would not understand. So I can speak like restaurant Czech. I can speak beer Czech, but no, I speak English and German. That's okay. That's it. And I can order beer in Czech. Oh, you know. that's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you worked for McGee's Ghost Tours. Yeah, boy, that was like five plus years ago now. Yeah, I'd say I did that for about a season, like six months. When I started that company, it was like November. So it was about five degrees Fahrenheit, negative 15 and uh, it was just bad because you have the top hat on. So your ears are just out there. And it was kind of like, the, 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 here's the black Madonna. And, and the, there's a really cool story about the Knights Templars. But where am I? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. If I could rattle off a story in, you know, five degrees, then I had it down. So, oh, that was a great job. That was a lot of fun. Well, so getting down to the meat of the matter, let's talk about Castle Hoska because you and Pete, your co-host, uh, you guys went there, right? Yeah, we've been there. So Pete does this whole thing where he does like this travel channel approach to podcasting. So he's in a wheelchair and he does not let that slow him down. So he used to be on the U.S. Paralympic fencing team. Like oh, wow. he's good with a sword yeah. <laughs> from his chair and uh, like you wouldn't want to mess with him. Yeah. And we've been to like reenactments. I've had to drag him out of the mud. Firemen have had to drag him out of the mud. Like so in Hoska Castle, we drove further than we're allowed, parked at the top of the hill and then went as far as we could. And then I just took his video camera and, you know, you know, went around the, we've, we've done that a hundred times, like to Alchemist Labs and this and that. But we went to Hoska Castle and had a walk around. And um, the tour guide there was like trying very hard to accommodate Pete. So he gave us the tour in English, like a copy of their, uh, let us take a picture of it and, you know, all the information they had and everything. And, you know, was talking to Pete and everything. So it's in the middle of nowhere. Major impressions, it's in the middle of nowhere, just in the middle of a, on the top of a hill, in the middle of the woods, not near any, you know, near some villages, but at the time it wasn't really. And creepy place. It's just creepy. There's little statues around and and the place itself is weird. It's just in the middle of nowhere and then towering and gloomy and it must have been in a movie somewhere, some backdrop to some Dracula thing because it's a weird shape. You must have talked about that last time, like the architecture and everything. Yes, we did just, talk about that a little bit. And that's actually it, an interesting question. I mean, it's surreal approaching it. You know, it's this forest and you and it's like this weird six-sided white thing. It's like you wouldn't even call it a castle. It's kind of almost more like a tower, a squat tower. It's just this weird thing. And then if you never heard any legends and you just walked up to it, it would still be weird, is my point. <laughs> it still has a creepy feeling. It does have a vibe about it. Yeah, for sure. So tell us a little bit about the actual tour and what you saw inside the castle and in the courtyard and that kind of stuff. So, okay. Now this is going back a couple of years, but I know that one point they made was he doesn't know the facts. Like the early history was very murky, but then he went off and to give a full history. So, which I, I know you guys went over like Ottokar II and it was built in the 12th century or something like this, but he went way more into the legend part of it. Because Your tour guide it, did? Do you remember who your tour guide was? 
I forget his name. I believe we actually have him on video at one point. Right. There's a Bohemian YouTube channel. You might be able to to snoop around there, but I don't I don't remember and I forgot to check. Right. I don't remember. He was like in his 40s to 50s, so he wasn't like a younger guy and he, and he really knew his stuff like he could answer follow-up questions. Right. Well, and he was very enthusiastic like he he liked telling the stories. My um, impression was that he did like to tell the legends as if they were fact. So he was like there was a huge fissure which covers, you know, one end to the other end. So if you look at pictures of Hoska Castle, and if you look at the courtyard, there's a grate in the middle, which kind of look like there's many courtyards and many castles in Czech Republic that look identical to that. Like there's a little grate in the middle where there used to be a well or that is still the well. Like even in Prague, some of the wells still have water and everything. Like it's a medieval town. It's weird. However, Hoska, what you see there is centuries of them filling in this fissure that apparently freaked them out in the early days, like 800 years ago, plus birds dying and just, you know, weird lights and sounds and whatever happened must have been enough for them to try to fill in this hole and then build a castle around it with the, you know, fortifications on the inside, like it's an inside out castle. And what you see today is really just the middle of the fissure, like the actual fissure is basically the whole courtyard, almost end to end. Like at some point you can see bedrock and then you see kind of like concrete. When you're standing above the grate, you're in the middle of the fissure. 800 years ago, you'd have fallen to your death. To my understanding, several 15 feet wide and twice that long or something. So are you saying that in your mind, it's not possible that that grate is a well for water? Now, to my understanding of the legend, the hole to hell was this massive crack. The right. castle could only be built after they started filling parts of it in. Unless like the legend got away. But if you're walking around, even inside, and then if you, so if you go in the rooms and then outside into the courtyard, you can tell parts that are like bedrock. And then you can tell parts that are kind of cobblestone or concrete, like mortar looking stuff. And that seems to me like, yeah, the fissure is way bigger than just that grate is my point. Right. Way bigger. The grate probably was a well. And who knows? Like, I don't want to make a strong stance here because it's so murky. I don't want to say, like, this is how it was because well, who Well, you know, knows? Th there's all these claims that there was no water at the structure that lends to the idea yeah. that, it's, uh, that lends it to the doesn't make sense. Why yeah. exactly? Yeah. So my question is, if the fissure goes right under the courtyard, I mean, how could you possibly have a well there if it's a, you know, seemingly, air quotes, bottomless pit or a pit to hell? Seems like the water would be super hot. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but like, yeah. and obviously now, I mean, they have tours there, they have events there. There must be water there now of some kind. I would imagine, or it, it just might have filled in. Because I remember looking down there not being like impressed as far as like, it's an abyss. No, I mean, it was kind of like, oh, <laughs> right. it went down a couple of feet. And then I think there was some pennies down there or something. Yeah. I mean, but what about the chapel being over the pit itself? On this site, uh, on the tour there, which, so then we went back to Prague and we were trying to like, go back online and even using using Google Translate to figure out check sources online. It was really rough to try to figure out. Tell me um, about it. So one, <laughs> yeah, because, oh yeah, even if you use, you know, Google Translate and try to figure out check stuff, there's just not a lot there. So the, the tour guide, one thing he said was, oh, they found an archeological site with old Celtic remains, but I couldn't find where, like, do they mean meters apart or is it right there? Is it like this mysterious spot? So, you know, the Celts worshipped in nature. Their temples were a meadow, a clearing, a waterfall, a beautiful spot in the river or something, or a mountain. So a hole to hell, that could be a Celtic holy site. But I couldn't find anything to corroborate anything, you know, like not even a lead, not even a red herring, not even a, a wild goose to chase, you know? Yeah. And then the other thing that they made a big deal about, and this I saw myself, was the pagan imagery on the murals. So the, they the frescoes. Back, not murals, frescoes. Yes. And this was something that they must have, they recently uncovered or renovated or something because it was clearly plastered over. And I'm not even sure it's all uncovered. So some of it is still under plaster, but some of the plaster came off. And at some point they found out, I guess recently in the last couple of decades, there's something under here. Let's figure out what it was. And honestly, the Travis Dow opinion is that's a big freaking question mark because A, it could be Going all the way back to Ludmilla and Drahomira, the pagan imagery, was this really a kick in the teeth to Catholics? Was this a out in the woods pagan shrine kind of thing? Like even after 
so Prague converted to Catholicism, like what, 10th century, 11th century, somewhere in there. Right. But even after this, there were holdouts. And like, was this one of those castles? Was this one of those places? Question mark. Nobody has the answer. If someone claims to, they're lying. The Nazis were really into this and they're all dead now. But if you ask them, their answer would be like, oh, yeah, definitely pagan site. And now and that's what the Nazis were into. So the Nazis did make a big deal out of Hoska Castle and had their little SS gatherings there. And who knows what their mass or rites or whatever. But they did meet there. Kind of like in Wolfenstein 3D. It was one of those one of those deals, <laughs> <laughs> just much smaller. And they were interested in that stuff. So the legend is real. And when I was a ghost tour guide, I would tell you if there was a legend that was real, it might not date back to anything prior to the 19th century or maybe the 18th century. You know, if our great grandparents believed in it, if it's a good story, if it's a good legend. I'll tell it to you. I might give you the disclaimer like, hey, here's this 19th century source talking about a 12th century castle, but that's his best. Yeah, as far as the frescoes, you know, there's like centaurs and a bow and arrow, and, and it's clearly like classic pagan imagery. And clearly in the centuries after paganism supposedly died out there, but it could also be astrological signs, which Catholics still were okay with. Trust me, as the history of alchemy guy, I can tell you like that went on. So if it was a constellation, we see pagan imagery all the way up until modern times, basically in churches. So maybe it was sure. something to do with that. Maybe astrology, maybe it was just a centaur with a bow and arrow. Maybe it was some... Well, it was, you know, it's something that Forrest noticed and he showed me and we found yeah. some images of it online too, was with the centaur. It's highly unusual because it's not a torso connected to a horse's body. It is a torso sticking out of what looks like the oh. head of a lion and a lion's okay. body and not a horse. And the, the lion's head is still there. I remember the tour guide said something about the fresco, and I don't remember if it was that one or yeah. something else, yeah. or also the way he was looking. He said it was like unique in the world. And I thought maybe it's what you just said. Maybe it was something else. But is it unique in the world because there's a special meaning behind it? Or is it unique in the world because the Czech Republic is a very long ways from Greece and they're copying a picture of a picture of a picture? Right. And <laughs> right. It's a telephone I, game. Again, like <laughs> it is a very intriguing factlet. Like it's a unique depiction of a centaur, or maybe it was one of the other frescoes as well. Yeah, I don't remember even what it was, but still, was that on purpose? Is there some symbology behind it? It might have been some rich Austrian count came in and said, you know what, paint it like the old uh, chapel in, in uh, Slovenia, and without any meaning behind it, without anything, and somebody just paints it up, and it's a centaur with a bow and arrow because Duke Rosenberg, whoever, or whoever had it, hunted. Right. That's it. Right. Who knows? I'll give you more questions to ponder and lose sleep over rather than clarify things. But um, <laughs> could you see evidence of the fissure outside the bounds of the foundation of the building? Not really. But maybe someone like an archaeologist with a fine eye could. On the outside, it's kind of like there's a layer of topsoil. And then we went in fall. So everything was kind of covered in leaves. Mm -hmm. I was trying to get a picture. So if I'm here in the 10th century, in 900 and something, what am I looking at? How big is the fissure? Because there's clearly bedrock. And I think the bedrock, you might have been able to, because there's a couple of boulders outside. So the top soil is very thin. There's trees, there's forest, but the bedrock's right there, which means where's the fissure? Does it keep going as a crack into the trees? I can't picture the thing because they've filled it in over centuries and then chiseled away and built a foundation. And then even the castle is like, what, this is version nine of, I mean, I don't even know, but it's, right. you know, version four or five of the castle. Yeah. But from the outside, no, it looks very clean cut and it's just normal topsoil with fallen leaves. And you'd have to dig down to look at the foundation, which I very much wanted to do. I mean, <laughs> you know, I just, yeah, I wish I had one of those um, radar machines where I could just like kind of oh, sweep ground, whole ground sweep penetrating yeah. radar, GPR. Yeah. GPR and look at the granite, like look at the actual bedrock and see what it does around the castle. Because I got the feeling that the fissure was way bigger than what you can see. Yeah. And the foundation itself, they had to shore up. Way bigger the than the hole you saw with the quarters in it. <laughs> yeah. Longer than the courtyard. Yeah. To my understanding. All right. So let me ask you this. There are some folks who think, including me, or who are wondering whether or not the stories of the architecture and the way that the building is supposedly aligned for defense from within instead of without, is that exaggerated? Or would you say that that's okay. a true representation of the so building? So I'll tell you, to the best of my knowledge, 
the best Czech sources I found were always very straight up. The castle is strange because it's like a unique castle in the sense that it was built inside out and then in parentheses, meaning the fortifications are pointing towards the inside. That's what, what the Czech sources are saying. Yeah, the Czech sources, and I could be one of those things like, well, that's the party line. It's written down somewhere, and everybody else is just copying and pasting that. Right. But Wikipedia says that, but so do other Czech sources. If you go to Czech Wikipedia, and then you say, oh, what's their source, and you click on it, and you go to that website, it just says, it's one of the specific ones. Is it the you know the one in the 17th century, or ah, in the 30 Years' War, it was occupied by the Swedes? In any case, in one of the reconstructions, it was like clearly built to face the inside. Okay. And now is it a, you know, it's a chicken and egg kind of problem. Did people see this weird castle? Because there's another one down the road on the next hill over, and it's not that different. So that's why I was like, wait, is that is one that, built inside out too? Are you talking about Bezdez? Bezdez, yeah. Yes. <laughs> wait, how do you Thank say you. it? Yeah. Bezdez? Why are you yeah. asking Scott? You told me how to say it. <laughs> Bezdez? It's a very soft D, but it's not a, yeah, so Bezdez. But that one's okay. mostly in ruins, right? Yeah. Because that was also built by Autocar II, like at the same time. That's also kind of in the middle of nowhere. Right. Hmm. So that kind of changes everything. Right. If anything, it makes everything a little bit more fishy. If you look at Hoska Castle, castle by itself without Bezdez, then I feel like you're cheating. And I can't give you an answer again. I just think like, wait, weren't they founded at the same time? And one theory I read was Hoska was founded as a construction village while they were working on Bezdez or Uh vice versa. Or Bezdez was merely the construction village while they were working on Hoska. And then eventually they built it into an identical castle. Uh Okay. If you want to believe the hold of hell theory, that's how you... There, but there's Bezdez, your I mean, the pictures that I've seen of it, it doesn't look like it's geared towards internal defense, or it looks more like a traditional castle to it, me. That looks more traditional, yeah, yeah. But were they like that originally? I, yeah, I don't know. Right. If you're walking around the castle, if you go up, then you you know, you know you go up and then there's like the balcony and you can look down into the courtyard and you have a great view of that great that you're mentioning and, and the whole courtyard and everything and the whole shape of everything. And I got pictures of like waving down at Pete like, hey, and it's very defensible towards the inside. Like you could imagine, okay, like here's where the archers would be and you'd be shooting towards the middle. However, not really. Like a lot of castles are like that. But the weird thing is, is that most castles then, when you turn around and face the wall, there would be these little windows to shoot out of to the outside world. Sure. And Hoska really didn't have that. That's why I think they they meant the fortifications are on the inside. It's really like from the outside, it's almost just like an apartment with no windows or just a squat tower. There was just very few windows. There was no fortifications looking outwards. So it's almost more like something you'd see in a monastery. Like people go there for solitude, but it's not really defensible. And yet it is. It has thick walls. But yeah, if I, if I was a bow and arrow shooting at something, the only thing I could really shoot at would be the inside. Right. From my impression looking around. So is that what they meant? It, it's weird. And I'm the history of alchemy guy. So I love like, oh, it's, it's symmetrical and has a shape to it. And it has pagan frescoes. Hmm. Neoplatonism, like Renaissance, magic, occult, anyone? That's my cup of tea. And and that's what the whole thing sounds like to me. It's like one big Illuminati conspiracy, really. But but the Nazis probably kind of thought something like that. Like it was some Renaissance, occultish kind of thing, early modern, whatever, you know, especially it's symmetrical. It has that six-sided shape. It's in the middle of nowhere for no apparent purpose. I mean, the Nazis had no idea what the original purpose was. Just like we don't have any idea. Didn't the Nazis burn some records? Or we're actually going to talk about that okay. in this in this uh, episode. I remember tonight, being really were... angry about something. There was some history loss at some point, which always gets my yeah. <laughs> well, they were storing books there that they had stolen ah, okay. and also had moved out of Berlin for safekeeping. Also, but local they were history or something. Like I thought maybe some of the reasons. Oh yeah, we didn't know come some of that. the answers we're asking is because some of the sources. Oh no, that's true. No, yeah. yes, they did. Dis- well, they destroyed records in yeah. general. Well, what we came across is that the RSHA or the Reich Main Security office did use Hoska as a administrative office at least and an operational yeah. center and you can bet that there's some intelligence going on and then probably interrogation possibly torture of the locals that bad Gestapo stuff going on well obviously they're going to be destroying those records yep. before the allies come yeah so other records just get mixed up in the crossfire and yep 
yes. get thrown on the heap. Yep. And we don't know if uh, Heinrich Himmler was there himself, but definitely there was interest in those and the surrounding castles for storing yeah. all of this material. And that's kind of something we're going to kind of get into. We're going like, to get into know, detail. Was it a cult or was it just like land records and things like that? Hey, happy birthday. Uh, you're a little late. That was last month. No, oh, no, no, not to you. I'm saying happy birthday to Blue Apron. Oh. They're turning five years old, and Blue Apron Wine, who we talked about last time, is celebrating its second anniversary. Oh, nice. Are you getting them anything? Because I still haven't seen my present. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Well, well, your Grey Friars all-night passes are in back order. Plus, they're coming all the way from Scotland. Oh. And no, Blue Apron gives you the present of fresh ingredients for home-cooked meals with top-notch recipes every week or whatever week you want them. But to celebrate Blue Apron Wine's second anniversary, they're bringing back all their customer favorites from the past two years. And they'll give you $25 off an order from their October selections. That's a pretty good deal. And I also saw in an email that they've partnered with the company Prepped to offer a really cool lunchbox that has modular containers, detachable cool sticks, and a jazzy thermal carrying sleeve so you can bring your leftovers to work in style. Wow. You know, in five years, Blue Apron really has grown to become an all-in-one solution for fine food, fine wines, cool kitchen utensils, and the learning resources to become a pretty decent home chef so you can put it all together. And now, for a limited time, starting September 4th, Blue Apron will be delivering recipes inspired by the winning dishes on MasterChef. Tune in to MasterChef on Fox every Wednesday at 8, 7 central and visit Blue Apron every Thursday starting August 24th to see and select the winning recipes to cook in your own home. Visit blueapron.com slash astonishing to get your first three meals free. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. This is Brock Randolph and you're listening to Astonishing Legends with Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Now, back to the show. So, did you visit the room known as Satan's office? Good question. It was like down in a hole or in the basement, and it had a was weird chair in it? I, I do remember going downstairs. It. Yeah, okay. A then weird, yeah. like, kind of gothic iron wooden chair. I don't know if it yeah. was even there when you were there. I feel like it might have been put there later, but I'm not sure. But here's... Oh, I got... I got pictures of a weird room downstairs, but I, I don't remember. I'd have to look at my old pictures. Well, you know, I asked Hannah McGee about it, of McGee's Ghost Tours, where you used to work. And this was the poignant thing that Hannah said to me. She said, Satan's office and that chair, that's all just, that's a gimmick. Something for yeah, tourists see, to look not, at. When I was a ghost tour guide, I had to really be careful because naturally my own personality is like, I have a filter. And when people tell me a ghost tour guide, I might come back with, Oh, 300 years ago, there was an author that wrote a ghost story. Well, what was the ghost story? I don't know. It, it wasn't real, so I didn't remember it. Right. Like, I have this thing where, you know, if I have a sense that this isn't fact, like, okay, whatever. And I had to overcome that because I had to repeat stories that I knew in my head weren't real. And I would even say, like, oh, okay, let me tell you a famous legend. And I had to preface it that way or I wouldn't have a clean conscience. So it could be that if, yeah, if they let us downstairs and like, oh, here's, I might have just tuned out, like, oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. right. That's not yeah. real. Well, that's kind of um, what I thought. We watched. Could have been, yeah. We watched the Ghost Hunters International show and they went oh, down in that okay. room and it was, but they didn't say anything about the chair. And that's what led me to ask Hannah if the chair was, and she said, no, but this was the funny thing. She said, no, that chair's made up. It's hype. Essentially it's a tourist yeah. thing. And then she got quiet for a second. And, and then she went the gateway to hell though. She goes, that's real. That's real. I can't remember what term she used, but she said that was real. And I was like, okay. Seriously, if you are in Prague, uh, and I tell people, I'm like, I know, it's kind of like because I used to work there and haha. -ha, but no, seriously, if you want to see the whole city, they even do uh, free daytime tours. And it's like legends, cool stuff, mystery, but it's also all backed up with history. They give you a lot of history and you walk through Prague. So I would just tell people, yeah, the first day you're in Prague, just spend a weekend doing every single ghost tour that you can find. You'll come out of there learning a lot about history. So Right. I did want to ask you one last question about Hoska that I forgot to ask you, and then we're going to let you go. But when you did your tour, did you hear anything about the possible presence of German mines in the building or explosives left over from the Germans? Because we had heard at one point that the reason so. that, okay, we had read somewhere that one of the reasons that no one has done any excavations to examine the fissure or the chasm or the pit or whatever 
is because there was a possibility of unexploded ordnance and, and that sort of thing left over by the Nazis. If they found something big metal, like just any metal detector would tell you like, oh, there's something huge and metal down there. Yeah. But this is the first I hear of that. Okay. Like unless they're like, oh, there's a hole and we have, you know, old ordnance to hide. Let's bury it there. Otherwise, like why would there be? But uh, who knows? Before we let you go here, thank you so much again for being on with us. And uh, it's really insightful. And again, the way we like to hear the information, just a, a couple of friends, you know, sitting around and talking about uh, fun experiences. But what we were wondering is, while you were there working for that six-month stint, did you yeah. see anything strange? Did you hear oh. about anything strange happening? Maybe not while you, that you saw, but to other people that were there while you were there. I don't even know how I should answer that. I should almost say that's proprietary knowledge of uh, McKee's <laughs> ghost tours. <laughs> you and have to pay the fee. Because <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what, I got some great stories down there, but a lot of them were actually of tourists. Um, so, I mean, obviously there's the, the ghost stories, the reason we're down there. But as we started to do tours, then the tourists started to see, smell, feel something, just get this weird sensation. The answer is yes. Like I have a couple of things. So everything, I can give you an alternate explanation. Even if I saw a ghost, straight up saw a ghost in front of me, I'd be like, oh, well, I guess I got ergot poisoning and I better go see. I mean, I would like not buy it at all. Like I'm that guy, you know, like <laughs> that's fine. I had med students that were like swore up and down. They smelled cadavers in a back room. Yeah. One of the ghost tour guides quit during the training. So I was on the training when he was kind of sitting by himself and he like stood up and got to the crowd and he was like, just look, why does it ghost? Yeah, and he, there was a shot that moved off that way, but there was nothing, it's just a wall. But there's all kinds of dead ends and corners and wells and So yeah. he saw and he, something he, that made him leave right that minute. Yeah, he never came back. He never went down there again. That I was there, I'll tell you. There was where a was, the, other, where was that? That was on a training. So there was like five new tour guides all together. Okay. And the next day there were four. Yeah, actually, that's true. Yeah. But I was kind of standing right next to him, and I wasn't creeped out at all. What he saw, what happened to him, never happened to me. I was down there hundreds of times, up to three to five times a week. So, I mean... Well, that comes back to the whole idea of personal experience, and are you seeing something just... There's horrible stories. Like, those I don't want to give away, because it is pretty exclusive. Like, only McGee's goes down there. And so you see, like, from the 30 Years War, like, graffiti etched into the wall, like 16, or a little bit before 30 Years War, like 16, 18, 16. And it's pretty cool. And it's hard to get down there. Unless when you, you say down there, what are you talking about? Okay. You're so talking about Prague tunnels is, under the city or? All of Prague was raised a whole level because of flooding, just like Seattle, for uh -huh. instance. So okay. underneath in the 14th century, that was Charles IV. So under Prague, there's a whole nother Prague. It's a whole, so if you go under underground, you're on 12th century cobblestones. They, okay. And it used to be some guy's living room. And then it was a torture chamber 400 years later. And now it's we take tourists there. Right. And Prague is famous for one thing above all else, and that is the astronomical clock. And then right to the left of that is Town Hall. And we started, like you go into the Town Hall, we start our tour underneath the astronomical clock. So the torture chambers were in the Town Hall, like in the basement, which used to be street level. Like you can actually make out the streets. You go out of a living room, cross the street into another living room. And it used to be a labyrinth. Like, it's just crazy. And there's some places where they've found human bones. Like, some of the ways of execution was execution by torture. And there's some places that when I, I caught myself, subconsciously, I just would never look down those holes. Because that's where they found the bones. I know horrible, horrible stories for a fact, really, that did happen down there. I just averted my gaze. And I've been down there a hundred times. And like the hundredth time, I was like, oh, I'm not afraid of this place. If all the lights went out, I could find my way out pretty easy. Still wouldn't look down that hole. Not well, with you the have your own, given your disposition in terms of skepticism, like even if a ghost was standing right in front of you, what is your final overall opinion on Castle Hoska? I don't want to say I don't believe in ghosts, okay? I've, I've never seen a ghost. Uh, definitively. Like, there's nothing I could not rule out. As a former ghost tour guide, I can tell you, I have given this some thought. And including Hoska Castle, I think you can go to Hoska Castle and it'll straight give you the heebie-jeebies because it is a creepy place. There's like a, a statue of Ludmilla on the outside that's just, just when you're walking up, you're like, it's weird. Like, that statue looks weird. Like, it's just kind of old and, you know, got lichens and moss growing on it. And the thing is, I don't necessarily don't believe in ghosts because people that believe in ghosts, are two kinds of people. It's really simple. They're people that have either seen a ghost and can't explain it away, or they're people that know people that they trust who have seen ghosts. 
And those people can't explain it away. Now, here's the thing. I know people, close family members and friends and people that I trust blindly 100%. And they tell me, Travis, I'm telling you, I saw a ghost. I'm like, were you dreaming? Were you just waking? You know, no, 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 no. Right in front of me, I saw a ghost. Ghosts are real. And I'm like, okay, cool. I will never argue with that person because I was not there. Okay. I want to make that clear because when I was going down in the torture chambers or even Hoska Castle, it is creepy. I wouldn't want to be at Hoska Castle at night. I would not want to spend the night there at all. The thing is that I don't want to believe in ghosts is because that was part of my job. It's like, I got to be there all the time. And if people's lights go out, that I'm the guy, people were on edge. I was afraid of like tourists getting heart attacks because they were just sure that they were going to see something. I had to like talk them down and try to not be so scary or tell a joke or something because people that do believe in ghosts, they believe it for a reason. And I do not judge in that it is scary. Where I was, and even, even like Hoska, I wouldn't want to be in that hole. I wouldn't want to be in those woods. I wouldn't want to be anywhere in like a 10 mile radius from there at, at like three in the morning. It is a weird place. So that was a fun interview. I love talking to Travis. He's great. We spent a lot of time talking to him at Podcast Movement a few That's weeks right. ago in Anaheim. Yeah. It was nice to meet him in person. He's a great podcaster and he has a lot of world experience. He's really fascinating and he seems to have boundless energy as well. Yeah, he's got a European approach to it, which is you travel all around as much as you can. You meet people. They come to stay with you. We're not used to that as Americans. Yeah, <laughs> like, that's true. Hey, you're here for a couple of hours. That's great. We'll meet you down at Chili's and then you're leaving, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then that's the end of that. But yeah. no, he's, he's traveled all over. He's very worldly. And the main reason is that he knows exactly what we're talking about here. He tonight. does. Yeah. He does. And when I first asked him to come on the show, I don't think I realized that he had done those ghost tours, which is really cool. And I had already talked to his boss, which was a sheer coincidence. I just reached out to her because she was, her company was the one that was mentioned on Ghost Hunters International. Now, to be clear, he wasn't the tour guide at Hoska Castle. He was the tour guide for the Prague Ghost City Tours. And they had lots of tours, but he was not leading a tour at Hoska, but right. he did go to Hoska yes. with his podcast partner, Pete. So. Yeah, that was kind of, what, yeah. what a score though, is because he knows the whole ghost tour guy. He knows both stick. sides of it. Yes, yeah. Exactly. And to his point, when I wasn't sure if we were going to be able to get him on the phone, I, I had already mentioned that we had reached out to Hannah McGee right. at McGee's Ghost Tours. And I had sent her some questions, some initial ones, which she already answered, which I already talked about. But then I sent her some more and she was out of town. She was on vacation, but she had some of her, she called them her girls. She had some of her girls yeah. answer these questions. And I had sent 10, most of which we already discussed and answered. But there was a couple of things that she said that I did want to share with our listeners because I think it's significant and important because this points to the whole thing of understanding what the place is really like. One of the questions that I had asked her about was about the water, whether or not there is water in the castle? What is the idea of having water there? Her folks wrote back that there is a lack of water in the castle and its surroundings due to the fact that the devil who settled in the castle shut out all the springs nearby. So that's obviously folklore. Yeah. She says, no one knows what the truth is about the devil settling in the well, but the fact that there is a lack of water is a well-known fact. However, it gets more detailed here in terms of actual real-world reasons about the water. They said in the 80s of the last century, the castle was in the hands of a state-owned company, Spolana Neradovis who tried to build a rehabilitation center there, but they needed a lot of water for this. So they drilled a nearly 300-yard deep well in the rock. It took that long to get to water. When the drill finally hit the water, they found out that it really, in quotes, came from the devil. It was highly radioactive. The explanation? Simple. The water came from hammer, or hammer, that's spelled H-A-M-R, where uranium was mined under the supervision of the Red Army. The miners simply poured in tons of sulfuric acid into the country, dissolving the surrounding rock, and then they pumped it out again. But a lot of radioactivity has gone underground up to 10 kilometers away, and that was the case of Hauska. So I think what's significant here, and this is coming straight from these people who do these tours who are in Prague, is that if you had to go 300 yards to get to water, there was definitely no well there prior to that. There was yeah. nobody that was going to 300 yards prior to this time period. That's a long ways down. It's a long ways for down. Renaissance well digging techniques. Yeah and, yeah, and obviously well techniques have improved since then, and sure. you can go that deep now. I know for a fact my own mom had problems with one of her wells actually dried up, and they had to find another one they had on to her land. It. Yeah, and they went to a thousand feet, wow. I believe, and it was incredibly expensive oh, and yeah. time consuming and difficult. And that's with all the modern technology. Even after Travis talked about it. 
you know, and, and of course he doesn't know the exact state of it because there does seem to be some water there, but we've had a few people say that, oh no, no, there's a fountain there. There's definitely yeah, an operating be- well and it's providing water for the whole building. It's like, I, that's not the case. Could be a cistern, honestly. Well, yeah, you know? it's something, right. But what you can see there is that there's a grate that's over the crack and the bedrock and there's some water in there, but it does not look to be a functioning fountain as we know it. No. Definitely not. And also, it's interesting, here's the other thing, and it it plays into all the lore. I mean, of course, if this was a more recent poisoning that happened due to the mining by the Red Army, but that water that is there even now is poisoned. Yeah. It's undrinkable, it's unusable. Yeah. Well, earlier when you talked about rehabilitation spas and health spas, it's funny you, you mentioned that because when we were talking about the Nazi bell, the old mine of Joachimstall. It was a silver mine. Yes. And the Joachimstaller, which is the silver coin that they minted there, that's where we get the term dollar. Oh, right. We mentioned that in Nazi Bell series. Exactly. So that was one of the first uranium, actually maybe the first uranium mine in all of Europe right there. That's why it was important to the Nazis. So we were talking about that before. Well, they originally thought that the stuff, the uranium that was coming out of the ground, not the silver, because of course the silver is what they want. They of course thought that was the value coming out of the mine and all the radioactive stuff was worthless. Well, what they tried to do is they turned that into a spa because they had radium infused radioactive water. And so it was, it was the radium palace that they had nearby in the, in the town where you could go bathe and you still can. You can go there and bathe in radium-infused water. Now, the concentrations are so low, there's background radiation everywhere. So yeah. it's so low, it doesn't really hurt you. But the idea, or, you know, it's one of those ideas that, uh, well, if you bathe in it, it stimulates... It's like the Q-bracelet. The Q-ray <laughs> bracelet. Or whatever that is, Q-ray bracelet. <laughs> we love yeah. that, yeah. I wouldn't call it pseudoscience because, of course, if it's high enough... It's just plain you'll bad idea. Yeah. Yeah, you, you will notice some difference. <laughs> yeah. I guarantee it. Yeah. But that's the idea, is that it's kind of a water health spa... And you just go relax in it and probably doesn't do a whole lot. Yeah, for I'm not you. gonna do that. <laughs> I mean, well, why take the risk? <laughs> but that's the idea though, is that water can become contaminated, of course. Right. And in this area, it seems to be uh, radium is a big deal, at least near that mine. The other thing that the uh, girl said at McGee's ghost tour, they just confirmed what Travis said and what everyone else is saying, that the entire defense system is directed against the quote, inner enemy. So there's speculation that perhaps there was something that was supposed to stay inside the castle and not get out. Well, exactly. And if you look at another resource, and maybe it is the Encyclopedia of Czech Castles, and it doesn't mention that or just mentions it as a plane layout, well, that doesn't discredit that or give credence to another theory is that that's the explanation given in that text. Right. What we're saying here, and what Travis said as well, is that the main line of discussion on the battlements all seem to be saying the same thing. So there's many different sources, but the main thing being said is that it does appear to be that way. And yes. that it seems to be more guarded towards something internally than externally. That's all we're saying. Right. And then the last point that they made that I wanted to share with you guys, because we asked them 10 questions and they sent, well, actually put all 10 of their answers up on Patreon for our patrons who want to read That's uh, a great answers idea. to those questions. The last point that they made was when we asked them about whether or not there had been any sort of Nazi experiments at the castle. Because as we indicated, we looked for that information and we're having a hard time corroborating it. And it would seem that there were rumors of it, but the rumors may be exaggerated. And I had forgotten that I came across some of this stuff when I was reading. We consume so much stuff in such a short amount of time, it's hard to keep track of everything. But one of the things they said was, it is quite difficult to find anything out about the experiments. The only thing that we found was that the castle, according to local witnesses at the time, served as a place for making the children of the true Aryan race. It was meant to be a lab for joining selected blonde, blue-eyed, and strong individuals. So that's, essentially that's (laughs) eugenics, which, and I remember now that I had read that somewhere as well, and I misplaced that fact. I had meant to point it out in the show. So there is this idea that maybe that was going on there. But the other thing they said, it was that it also just may be an exaggeration that it was a brothel for German soldiers. Well, the idea that they're trying to tie this all into their overarching idea of the superior Aryan race and Ananerba makes sense. They were trying to do that. And was that going on here at this location? In a lower, more crude form, maybe. (laughs) Right. Yes, it could have just been a German joy division. Now, we'll probably never know officially, because as we have mentioned, any records of that would be destroyed. 
yes. by the Nazis themselves. So good luck trying to find that. But that then turns into folklore. One of the other things that we asked Travis about was he had had this story of another hellhole in Prague proper, in the city, very close to the Prague castle. We asked him to tell that story, and he did, and it is super fascinating. It relates to St. Ludmilla, who we talked about in part one, and her daughter-in-law, Drahomira, who had her murdered. And it is a fascinating story. He told the whole story. It's about seven minutes long. This episode was already kind of long, so we've actually cut that out, and we are presenting that in its entirety on Patreon for our patrons at all pledge levels. So look for that there. Yeah, it's a nice little Patreon bonus, and it does involve hell holes. There you go. All of this just reminds me, it's kind of a point of fact that we frequently discuss topics about places that we haven't been. And we hope to go to all of them sooner or later. Right, right. Except for Greyfriars Kirkyard. (laughs) uh, (laughs) Oh, you'll go to (laughs) Castle Huska, but you won't go to Greyfriars. It's Hoska. 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 Well, actually, I'd I'd heard it as an SH, kind of a very very light uh, Hoska sound. So, yeah, we'll never get it right. No, but I'm telling you that Travis. Yes, no, I know. He lived there, says Hoska. He's the one that told me to say Hoska. Hoska. Yeah. What's funny is that his feeling was, it reminded me a lot of Gray Friars. Yeah. Because if you go there, yeah, nothing's going to happen usually, but people will say for both places that there's a palpable, creepy feeling about it. And yeah. he's, a, he, that's, he's a no-nonsense guy. Like I said, he's been all over Europe, seen the most mysterious, darkest places, worked at a few, and this definitely gives him the creeps. Yeah, I, I loved how he said, I wouldn't want to be there at three in the morning, <laughs> on the yeah, grounds, not, inside, yeah. outside, anywhere near it. And right. that's with him being, I would say, generally open-minded but skeptical about yeah, no, a lot I, of the kinds of things that we talk about on our own show. Absolutely, and I, that's why I love about but his But he still approach. has that fear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he's yeah. very even about it, and he's yeah. very fair, and he's not cynical at all. And I wouldn't even say maybe agnostic about the feeling or, yeah. or about thoughts about ghosts. It's like, well, everything that I've seen that's kind of strange, I can attribute that to a regular everyday phenomenon. But if you're a good friend, somebody I know really well, and you tell me that that happened to you, and you believe it, it's like, all right. I'll go with that. Well, we had that friend, our our friend Marty, who was on the show early on when we first started out, who saw something in his stateroom on the Queen Mary. Yeah, there's nothing, uh, I'm getting the sense that there's a lot of listeners out there that believe that I just believe anything about the paranormal. (laughs) Uh, no matter what, it's like, yep, it's paranormal. And that's really not the case. No. The differentiation I like to make is that I'm open to all possibilities. I'm not cynical in that way. It's like, I'll consider whatever's going on, and I don't think that some things are impossible. So that's my only approach, but yes. Well, the the other thing I think that I like about your approach, which is yeah. different from mine. Slightly and, slightly. and mine has changed since we've started. <laughs> right. I'm definitely... Your needle has moved. As, mine, as yeah, the say. needle has shifted a little bit. But the thing that I like about your approach that I just am not capable of. When we talked about on our Kelly Hopkinsville series, when we got into it about that Frontiers in Psychology paper, which, boy, that's a whole thing is unfolding there, which we'll tell you once it gets all... uh, Yeah, that's exciting. There are developments, slight, but there are developments happening. Some slight developments, and we've had a really engaging conversation with a new friend of the show that maybe we'll have on to talk about it after it all gets sorted out. Yeah. But in the meanwhile, the two phrases that I love, the new things that we've added to our vocabulary with these past couple of episodes, Mm -hmm. one was, and I got this from Ghost Hunters, personal experience versus something provable, some information that you have. You can point to a device that shows a sound or infrared camera where you can see something. Yeah. That is a provable experience that if someone says, hey, this happened to me, and then that technical gear is corroborating it, great. (laughs) But if it's a personal experience, it's a little bit more like what Travis was saying, where he had the guy next to him, the guy next to him freaked out and left the training, and Travis was sitting right there and didn't see anything. That guy had a personal experience that was not witnessed by any sources, but it was enough that he was like, that's it, I'm out of here. <laughs> this is your first day on a job where you could be, you know, having fun and making some money. And he's like, nope, yeah, no, that nope, happened. nope, yeah. nope, nope. Yeah. yeah. So that's the interesting thing there. But what I was going to say to you, the other thing that I'd learned besides the personal experience thing, the takeaway from this series was also about the going back to Kelly Hopkinsville and the whole Frontiers in Psychology paper that we had talked about the erroneous citation in mm. was the need for cognitive closure which I thought was really fascinating. It's something I'm probably going to be saying over and over forever. Uh, <laughs> so now you're you know, new, at least the next year. It's yeah. one of my new catchphrases. It's another mug. Well, actually, it's yeah. going on our uh, new line of pint glasses yeah. we're now developing. Well, no, yeah. Suggestions from our listeners. I do like that. But I also yeah. like the idea of maybe a new coffee mug that says, <laughs> forget coffee, I need cognitive closure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear, I got I got the idea. Yeah, what No, it? it's a travel mug, and the lid says cognitive closure. Oh, 
Isn't that very, like that? That's yeah. very good. Very clever. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now someone's just ripping it off yeah. on, on Etsy. But, but anyway, what I was going to say with respect to your disposition on this stuff is, and if you're sensitive to the idea that you believe everything, which I think is not a fair characterization of you, but the, right. but I do think that what you don't have is the need for cognitive closure. You almost have the opposite of it. <laughs> you have a need for cognitive openness. Yeah, right. And I think that works to your advantage because yeah. when you take a look at cases, it can be this one, it can be Kelly Hopkinsville, it can be whatever, you're not trying to put it in a package. Well, here's which yeah, I think is yeah. a better approach. It's honestly, it's a well, more of a you. realistic yeah. approach to things. I don't think I can do. It. I think that cognitive closure thing is built into my psyche. I have to fight it. Whereas I feel like your natural state is. Right. Let's not be so quick to wrap this up and put a little bow on it. You, know? you bring up an interesting point, and maybe this is for the Haddam Files number two, if we ever do do another one. I'm still recovering from the first one. <laughs> but we always say this phrase, trying to hammer that square pig into the round hole. And to, it's as good as it's going to fit. If this thing's going to splinter, I'm going to take that mallet, and this is going to fit because I need it to. And right. that's kind of the metaphor here. My point is that, yeah, I can let it go. I don't need to... And this is not to say that I'm unafraid, but we talk about this as well, is that a little bit, the sense that we get, and not the people who are really mad with us, but they're mad at the concept, and it does not sit well with them. The reason is because the feeling that we get from their descriptors is that it's scary. Yeah. It's scary to accept that possibility that not everything in their realm is controllable. And that's, by the way, how I feel about Skinwalker. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> about the ranch. Yeah. Well, yeah, because yeah. you don't know what is, there's so many different things going on there and it's undefinable and it's uncontrollable and- And it's uh, well documented. It's well documented. You know, mostly- And it's billionaires un- <laughs> and governments are involved. It's unobservable yeah. and unrepeatable, but there's enough going on that it makes you wonder. And that's what's scary to people, I believe. And it's not, again, not, I'm saying that I'm not scared or I wouldn't be startled at some of this. Certainly I would. We can all be startled. But the concept of it doesn't scare me. Yeah. And I can live with that. It's like, all right, well, I, there is no explanation for this. Well, the other thing is, some, and you don't say it so much anymore, but when we first started out the show, one of the things that you used to say that I loved was yeah. live with the question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also ripped that off from a movie. Oh, oh. <laughs> like, well, no, I, all the romance I saw it. it. No, it's a, it, yes, was it Mammoth? I'm just a sounds huge like a Mammoth pile quote. of movie references. <laughs> no, it's called The New Age. It's uh-huh. a Michael Tolkien film that he he wrote and directed. It's an interesting film with Peter Weller and Judy Davis. Oh, Peter Weller. He's now a history teacher, I believe. Really, a Robocop, no right? Yeah, he teaches literature and fine arts classes at Syracuse University. Well, there you go. And is one of their most popular professors. And in 2014, he obtained his PhD in Italian Renaissance art history and Roman history. Wow. Conferred by UCLA. Oh, very impressive. And Robocop got smart. <laughs> well, it's, well, he's part robot. He can yeah. remember all that stuff. Yeah, he just exactly. jacks in and, and uh, downloads it from the mainframe. Yeah. But there is a character played by a, uh, a really good character actor I like, Patrick Bauschau, or Bauschau. Okay. He's, uh, I believe he's German. And at the very end of the film, it's not really a spoiler, but it's kind of a new age guru and tying with the name. And that's his thing. It's like, hey, you know what? Just live with the question. Live it's, with the question. Yeah. So, and at the very end, he pops pops in for kind of a one-on-one breaking the fourth wall cameo where he says that again, just to kind of hammer yeah. that home. So, All right, so I guess you're you giving can, you credit can, where credit's uh, I'll due. Give a, I'll give the credit to Michael Tolkien. He yeah. wrote the movie? Yes. Remember okay. uh, The Player? Yeah. Yeah, that's the guy. Oh, okay. So he wrote The Player? Uh, yes, he did. Oh, so okay. he's got some interesting uh, movies under his belt. Well, yeah, and I think uh, the player was actually a book first, so maybe I wonder if he did that and then got into film or was doing screenplays. Interesting. No, he's he's a pretty good writer. Of course, there's Armageddon, the uh, Michael Bay meteor movie, but he wrote one as well that I think is much more interesting he called wrote Deep... Armageddon. No, 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 no. He wrote oh. Deep Impact. Oh, yes. That's a little more serious, let's say, not as flashy. Right. It makes you think, and it's more realistic in that sense, but right. uh, interesting guy. Anyway, yeah, I don't live by these, <laughs> or, I, or really do I make it a mantra to aspire to. It's something nice to remember, but there's another phrase, though, that I always remember. It's a rabbinical saying, I believe, and I believe I saw a rabbi on TV saying this, to the non-believer there are no answers, but to the believer, there are no questions. Yeah. You so kinda, what you're telling yeah. me is you're essentially Chauncey the Gardener from being <laughs> I'm, a, just a I'm a reincarnated 11th century rabbi. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> you're, you're a collection of movie quotes and TV quotes. Yeah, all, hey, There's look how far he got. Yeah, yeah, he got to beat the president. Come on. <laughs> It'll get you far in life. 
going back to the castle and what you may experience is that we always try and relay the creepy and the scary with places like this and Grey Friars is that, well, you're probably not going to go there. Look, it's really out of the way. <laughs> go to Prague, <laughs> enjoy your week there. Uh, look at the sights. If you have some time, it's going to be like, say, an hour drive yeah. to get up there. And it's kind of like, I guess, what tourists say about the Tower of Pizza is that when you go to Pisa, just the tower is there. There's not a whole lot of other stuff around. I also like the Taj Mahal. So it's kind of one of those sites where you, you go out of your way, you spend a day on your vacation just to see this one thing. Yeah. So you could say you saw it. Yeah. It's an interesting place. And what I'm interested in is the person who doesn't believe any of this totally debunks it. It's all crazy talk. And then they go there and they're creeped out. Now, why are you creeped out? Yeah. Because of the history? No. Because there's a vibe there. Right. There's something about it. Like Travis said, and he's more open to it. But there's definitely a vibe. So, of course, one of the main reasons we had Travis on was to maybe clear up some of these questions that listeners had about, come on, was there really no water there? And how big is this crack? Is there really a hole? Were the ramparts and the embattlements, were they really kind of more pointed inwards or is that kind of baloney? Well, he gave you his rundown from having been there and having seen a lot of other Czech castles. I did want to point out one quick thing, and then I think we should talk about the Nazi occupation of the castle, essentially. In an effort to come clean about some of the details in the story yeah. that don't necessarily contribute to the spookiness of it or to the lore, yeah. there are some things that we had always planned to share with you here in part two, because we wanted part one to be the fun, No, well, we said we do the setup, stuff. Sure. Yeah, we, and, yeah, and we're not exaggerating. We're just saving some of the details that start to break down what was legend and what is fact for the later part of our series where we get into the root of what we think started the original story and right. how much of that is rooted in folklore or maybe an exaggeration or lost over the generations or invented over the generations, I should say, and how much of it is explainable, like the fact, something that we already mentioned in part one, I think was uh, about Ferdinand the Second who had some of the external defenses of Castle Hoska removed. There was a moat, it was filled in, and there was some uh, earthen ramparts that were taken down. Right. But that doesn't change the fact, just like Travis said, who went there and has been to 100 castles probably in the Czech Republic, said there was no way to shoot arrows out from the inside of this building. Now, again, the building's been remodeled umpteen billion times and by 50 million people. Exactly. That's the problem is that it's passed between dukes of the region so often and royal families and just whoever's gotten control of the, the region, the yeah. Swedes, wars going on. And that's part of the problem why the history of it is so patchy and that you have different eras that weren't well recorded. You have others that were. And so... Yeah. And you essentially had squatters all along the way. Yeah. So some, you can't be surprised when right. you can't find a lot of information about the squatters when nothing was written down and what was written down was written in check. And it's very hard to get to in the first place. Right. Yeah. So you'll, you'll find some documents on it or some research done on it, but it may conflict by yes. equally credible sources and researchers. Which is what we find on every show we Yes, do. no we academics. We will find tons yeah. <laughs> of credible, well-researched material that's cited, papers, documents, all kinds of uh, scholarly publications, and they won't agree with each other. Yeah, well, and, we, we said this early on, yeah. is that because, again, you get to certain uh, uh, jumping-off points, especially in, in the academic community, where it's like, well, we have this theory and hypothesis that we're working under, because you have to fill some of that in. But there are different camps. We've said this all along, especially with archaeology, where it is kind of sketchy, the ancient past. So you're just going to have to research your own stuff or listen to some other podcast and make your own conclusions. Do your own reading and settle on the story that you want to believe in, because that's kind of what some of these academics are doing. That's a good point. And so, and we have to make choices along the way. We're not going to present every single thing we found. We're going to, so the one that makes the most sense to us, that's what we're going to present. No, just know that there's, a, there's two or three really, really super interesting things that we just forgot to mention with yeah. every subject. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's, there's is, always like, oh, I can't We're always believe. kicking ourselves. But yeah, getting back to the castle, speaking of architecture, that's why it's kind of a mishmash. Not only does it have Gothic elements to the castle and is mostly maybe in that style, but it's also very Romanesque in some ways and has Renaissance influence with yes. the architecture. So the overall point, again, that we say that's undeniable is that it does not look like the other castles in the area. Right. And according to oral history and tradition, going back to its early days, it has always been extremely unusual. 
One of the fun things about doing this podcast is that even if we think we already know a lot about a topic, we end up learning so much more about it once we dive into the research. That's also a great thing about The Great Courses Plus. Their own astonishing research core, meaning their collection of the best professors and experts in each field, will teach you so much more about a subject than what you're already familiar with that it's like you didn't even know anything about it in the first place. You're now in the big leagues of learning. That's what's happening to us with their brand new series, The American West, History, Myth, and Legacy. You probably already know that Forrest and I love stories about the American Old West, but mostly those are legends about its heroes and outlaws. This latest series is really giving us a good brushing up on its true history, separating fact from fiction. One simple thing we can clear up right here, or really just give our listeners a clearer picture for their mind's eye, is the geography of the Old West. We have a lot of overseas listeners who might not know just how big a piece of land we're talking about here when we use the term the West. And it's funny and maybe a little sad that a lot of Americans don't know much about the geography of our own country. Well, it's understandable in one sense, because for over 150 years, there's been so much mythologizing about the American frontier, which is also partly why people around the world have been fantasizing about cowboys in the Wild West since its discovery. But to give you an idea of roughly the total area we're talking about, it's all almost as big as Europe, and contains some of the hottest and coldest places in the inhabited world. If just the state of Texas were superimposed on a map of Europe, it would stretch from northern France to western Poland. Oh, that's some big country, I reckon. Well, hmm. those pioneer men and women were no doubt hardy and adventurous people, and that spirit of the West is definitely a part of the American character. We're having a ton of fun diving into this series, and you can too, like right now and wherever you go, because their over 8,000 lectures are streamable and downloadable. All you have to do to get started with a free whole month of unlimited access is go to our special URL, which is thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. Once again, to start your free month of unlimited access today, go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash legends. I'm Robin Peacock, and I have two bird names. When I'm not looking for the Mothman, I'm listening to Astonishing Legends. Let's get back to the show. Let's talk about the Nazis. Um, oh, sure. This is the next phase in this castle's life, which is when we left off in the last show, we got right up to this point. Point of clarification, I yeah. know, is my ending statement there. I, we last left off with the Czech romantic poet Maka. And that would be the early 19th century, was it 1830s, 1820s, 1830s? Yes. 1830s. 1830s. It's only been a few days, but it seems like 1836 forever. was the date That's of the right. letter that he wrote to his friend Edward Hindle. Yeah, and, the, about and his vision. when he died, too. Yeah. So, right, because he, he died And he died soon in after November that. of that year. Yeah. 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 What I said made it sound like I was talking about the 1830s jumping to the 1940s, but I meant we're going to go now to the era of the 30s and the 40s. Right. And that would be the era of the Nazi occupation of the castles of Bohemia. Yes. Now, during this time, as you heard in the opening tonight, the Nazis took over four castles in the area, a Hauska being one of them, with the codename Burgund II. And the interesting thing about that is it's not 100% clear what they were doing there. But part of what they were doing there has been fairly well documented. And this is a, both a sad and interesting story. But in 1935, Himmler, Hitler's right-hand man, founded the H Sonderkommando, H standing for Hexe, H-E-X-E, -E, which was the German word for which. And, and still is. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and still is. Good <laughs> yeah. point. I should have said is the German word for which. And the goal of this group, which was made up of SS officers, was to collate as much material as possible on sorcery, the occult, and the supernatural. So these guys were out collecting books. Uh, collecting is actually a friendly word. Confiscating books, taking yes, books right. from uh, collections. They were shutting down Masonic temples, taking all the books from the temples. They were raiding libraries of any group of people that the... Nazis were ideologically opposed to, which is pretty much everybody. Well, but that's, they, but, and that's know, a good, specifically exactly. Masons, Jewish organizations as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. there's a lot of uh, Jews that are Masons, and yeah. they saw that organization as a threat, as as you just said, with many other organizations, the Catholic Church and especially the Communists. Yes. So any book, any publication that was not in accord with mainstream, get that mainstream German ideology at the time was confiscated and put into a category for study or just to 
squirrel away so that people couldn't access it. Right. Well, the group that was in charge of this was set up by the Reich Main Security Office, which is the abbreviation for is RSHA because it's a big, long German word that I can't say. (laughs) But that was created to research these opposing ideological views to the Nazi party. And that was headed by a man named Ernst Schambacher, who we'll come back to in a second. And within the Reich Main Security Office, there was what was called the AMT7, VII, or the Seventh Office. Yeah, AMT, I think is... uh, Is that how you say it? Well, it translates into office. Right. I thought possibly if there was a period after it, maybe it's Arbeiter, which is work or just your job. So basically office or project division here. And they had broken down these books that they were after into four categories. Church and pseudo-religious groups, theosophy, Freemasonry, and then Marxism and Judaism. They were collecting anything that had to do with this. And one of the things that was interesting about this, they had a, a bunch of them in a Masonic hall in Berlin, but they were concerned about the bombing raids. And so they moved everything out to the castles in Czechoslovakia after that region got handed over to Hitler, basically. And it was perfect because it was outside the targeted bombing area. Yeah, you're down in the Sudetenland. Yeah. yeah, and you're next to mountains. So it's pretty remote. There's not a lot of uh, enemy, well, in their view, enemy activity. So it's yes. a safe place. And according to some of the sources that we found, it indicated that there was about, across the four castles that the books were stored in, there was about half a million of them. So here's what's really fascinating about this. And there's been some debate as to the Nazi interest in occultism and mysticism and that sort of thing. It was something that Himmler was absolutely, definitely interested in. And some people say that Hitler was as well. Other people say that it was Himmler's fantasy world and Hitler just let him do whatever, right, Himmler do right. whatever he wanted. Yeah. So there was a little bit of a debate about how much Hitler was actually into this stuff from what we can see, from opposing, again, like we were just talking about, there's lots of opposing viewpoints from historians about that. I think what's not debatable is that he, Hitler, gave Himmler, Heinrich Lütpold Himmler, a lot of power because from 1943 to the end of the war, he was not only chief of German police, but he also minister of the interior and head of the Gestapo, which is their secret state police. He was overseeing all the internal and external police and security forces. So since Hoska is now, at the very least, an administrative headquarters for the security service, RSHA, that there are some intelligence and information gathering activities going on there, which were top secret. Right. And here's the thing that's really fascinating about this, about I want to talk a little bit about Himmler's motivation. There's lots of places where you can read about this. There was actually one particularly interesting, and this is a blog entry. I found other higher-level sources that are a little more specific, but this was a good sum up. This is actually from ancientorigins.net, which I get emails from. They publish a lot of yeah, fascinating Yeah, I, I like stuff. them, yeah. And that article, which was written by Natalia Klimczak, or Klimczak, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, K-L-I-M-C-Z-A-K, at Ancient Origins, was headlined, Stash of Books from the Witch Library of Nazi Chief Himmler found in Prague. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that particular article and the origins of of this information. They are specifically referring to some books that are in the Prague National Library that supposedly came from Hoska. And there's a couple of things I just wanted to quote from that article about why Himmler was collecting these books. Himmler thought that the actions of the Catholic Church's Inquisition were purposefully trying to repress an indigenous German pagan nature-based religion. Volkish, in a conspiracy against the Aryan race. He even tried to find proof for his own magical roots, and according to biographers on Himmler, he discovered that one of his ancestors was burned as a witch. His anger at these acts appeared in anti-Christian propaganda. He began to hate Christianity and believed that he owed his successes against it to the ones who were murdered for having a knowledge of magic. And then another paragraph that I wanted to quote from there, Himmler is credited as the founder of esoteric Hitlerism. He was also deeply involved in astrology and tried to construct a new pseudo-Germanic neo-pagan religion based on a cult created in his imagination. He approved officially pagan holidays and manipulated the facts connected with traditional pagan cults. So this is really interesting. And by the way, this also, again, reminded me, I know we brought it up in part one of Krampus and how they still celebrate Krampus at Christmas over there. It's what's left of a pagan ritual. It's fascinating. When you look back at how all of this stuff is connected and the ideas that we've talked about 
And it's been a battleground. The Czech Republic has been a battleground, and Travis even made an allusion to this, and we talked about it in part one, for Christianity coming in and replacing paganism, Yeah, in which some cases was not such a pretty process. In other cases, people converted, and it wasn't such a big deal, like St. Ludmilla. As we mentioned in part one, when you let the local populace have some of their favored traditions, yes, uh, they're much more willing to accept the foreign idea coming at them. And what was happening here is that you see Himmler and a, and a large group of his adherents and people who thought the same way get to a populist movement with uh, Volkisch, which is a, a return to the natural, or as they call it, the organic German ways. Right. Which is basically from prehistory, how they evolved into their own culture. And don't tell us what to do kind of a thing. We're going to go back to our German roots. And it also has a lot to do, of course, with race. Yes. Now, to your point, Himmler was so fascinated that he, as we mentioned in our Nazi Bell episodes, and, you know, you're starting to notice a lot of tie-ins here. I am. Same region. Hans Kammler, all these folks kind of popping up on the, the fringes. Bell project, right? Yeah, because some of these folks are popping up around the edges here because, again, you are in the same area. You're talking about a source of uranium not too far away in one of the Czech mines. And this project called Anen Nerbe, which was headed by Himmler, Hermann Wirth, Richard Walter Dare, was a research project to find the archaeological and cultural history of the Aryan race. So this is not just a weekend get-together with some of the boys drinking beer and eating sausages. This is a formal project sanctioned to find new evidence of the racial heritage of the Germanic people. But Himmler was so wrapped up with occultism that it became his own, let's say, personal weapon or tool to use in kind of, again, hammering this folk movement into his own kind of personal fascination with the occult, and especially with the German race, where he saw the Nordic peoples taking over the world like he thought they once did. Right, and he's becoming what he probably thinks will be a future cult leader within the Third Reich, and Hitler's letting him do that. And the other thing that is interesting about this is that he thinks that you can take a scientific approach to mysticism and witchcraft and all of these ancient traditions and really get something of value from it and then use it to oppress and control your enemies. Collecting all of these books, hoarding these books, it's kind of the classic thing about the uh, hypocrisy, because what was happening was there were the famous Nazi book burnings, which were done by the German Student Union in Germany and Austria in the 30s, where they were burning any topics that were viewed as being subversive or representing, again, ideologies opposed to Nazism. Joseph Goebbels, at a speech in Berlin, actually said, quote, no to decadence and moral corruption, yes to decency and morality and family and state. I consign to the flames the writings of Heinrich Mann, Ernst Glaser, and Eric Kastner. Mann had written books against fascism and satirized German society. Glaser wrote about pacifism in his most successful novel, Jargang 1902, which is described as an autobiographical novel about a youthful political and sexual awakening that is both sad and humorous. And Kastner was also a satirist, and he wrote children's literature and actually went on to be nominated for a Nobel Prize four times in the 60s. So this is the kind of stuff that they were burning. Yeah. And then the Reich Main Security Office was also collecting all these other books for the categories that we were talking about that include the pseudo-religious groups and theosophy and Freemasonry. And they were banning those books. That was their party line, was that the books were banned. So in addition to collecting them all, they are essentially hoarding and studying books that they are saying are forbidden. Right. Which right. is another thing that's happening. And by the way, Hoska is all in the middle of this. It's a collection point, certainly. And part of the argument here is that, well, what do they care about some of these books? One, they're labeling them as deviant. The ones that don't agree with the party line and the main wholesome German, you know, fairy tale here. But really, it's also reconnaissance because part of it, as you said, it's to collect and see what the enemy is up to. Understand what are, what the are their secret texts? Yes. What did they believe? How can we turn this against them? And that specifically relates a lot to the Masonic books that they collect. Yeah, because it was, again, it's not secret if you decide to become a Mason, but they saw it as a Jewish conspiracy to a large degree and an enemy of the SS and uh, the Third Reich. As a little aside here, 
I was in Berlin and I can't remember what square it's in, but it's where they did a lot of the book burnings, I was told by my German oh, friend. Okay. And there's kind of a really cool monument and it's very subtle and, and very German in that way is maybe, I don't know, six feet by six feet square and it's plexiglass and there's a space underneath and it's lit and it's all white. When you look down into it, what it is is stacks and stacks of empty white library shelves. Oh, right. Where all the books are missing. Now. Yeah. So it's a nice monument. It's very subtle. And you look down, it's just kind of a cool thing. You look down into it and it's like an empty all white library. Right. With no books. Right. Because they were burned. Yeah. The point we're trying to make here is that their effort was to control everything. And if you think like, well, Hitler wasn't into this stuff. Well, his main goal was to win at any cost, any cost. So if letting Himmler do his crazy Volkish thing with the occult and all that, and that's going to help us, sure, let him go do this because maybe there's something to it. They were open to this idea because as we said, he gave Himmler, at least up until some military failings, towards the end of the war, immense power and control. So he was left alone to kind of pursue this and see what was up with it. And he had a lot of resources and money and manpower at his disposal. To move on from here, this is what's interesting about this. This has really been a big deal in the news in the past few years. In fact, there was an article that came out on March 16th of just last year. It was written in the local No, which is short for Norway, and it was published there. It's called Norwegian Witch Books Stolen by the Nazis Found. And this is something that I want to point out about this story and where it's going. One of the things we found today was an article from a blog written by a journalist or a blogger named Heather Green. The blog is actually called The Wild Hunt, and here's the sub-headline for that, Modern Pagan News and Commentary, which I thought was interesting. But one of the things that Heather Green wrote about in her article there was that there were no occult or witchcraft books in this collection. And the collection specifically is part of a exhibition now called Books Discovered Once Again. And there's a really cool website for that, which we have a link to. We yeah, have links to a, all this stuff, by the way. That's a major check project to get these books back organize them, get them to the rightful owners, and just kind of see what do we have left. Right. And this is only a small collection of them, of the original books. There's only about 12. It's been quoted as both 12,000 and 13,000 in various sources that we found books that are part of this collection that supposedly are all related to witchcraft. But what this woman is saying at the Wild Hunt on the Modern Pagan News and Commentary blog, who one would think would be interested in finding books about witchcraft. She's saying, she wrote an article entitled, No Witchcraft Books in Prague. And that's according to one of the historians that's going through the books. Now, this historian's name is a program manager. Her name is Marcella Struholova. And she has said that the news reports of these books being occult books are, quote, not only exaggeration, but nonsense, end quote. According to Green, who wrote the article, the occult aspect could be attributed to the Norwegian article that I mentioned from March 16th of last year in the local no, and that that was a misnomer, misinformation about the occult nature of books that caught on like wildfire, and then it ran rampant all over the web, and that is true. If you go and you start looking into this, you will find dozens upon dozens of articles citing this discovery of witchcraft and occult books in Prague in the library there. Getting back to the H. Sonderkommandos, one of the things that Himmler had ordered them to do was to carry out a massive survey of witch hunt trial records in Europe. His SS troops combed 260 libraries and archives to find traces of the witch trials of the Middle Ages. According to academics, Himmler was on a mission to prove that the prosecution of witches was tantamount to an attempt by the Roman Catholic Church to wipe out the German race. And that is also attributed to the Norwegian paper and article. So I guess what I'm trying to say here, what's interesting about Heather Green's point of view, and it's not necessarily her point of view because she's talking to the historian who's dealing with the books herself, is that these books aren't occult books or witchcraft books. And so then that got me to wondering, are we dealing with an exaggeration of the idea of what all this literature was? But then we have all this other research that points to the fact that Himmler was definitely collecting that stuff, not only through the Hexa group, but also through office number seven or the seventh office or whatever. They, yeah. All that stuff was working together to collect all this material. And that's what a lot of historians are saying in a lot of different places. But then we have these people here saying, hey, look, we found 12,000 books, but they're not really occult books. So then we started to say, well, what does that mean? Are they occult books? Because in Heather Green's article, they mentioned, well, 
it's probably a misnomer because the term occult, according to just a simple dictionary search on Google as a noun, one, supernatural, mystical, or magical beliefs, practices, or phenomena. The example sentence is a secret society to study alchemy and the occult. As an adjective, of, involving, or relating to supernatural, mystical, or magical powers or phenomena. As a verb, cut off from view by interposing something. I actually learned this just this past week what, because the you moon... You cut somebody off? No. Oh. The moon occulted Venus. Yeah. And uh, it, when be, I saw dark that, or I, was, hidden. I was like, does that mean they joined a secret group? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, someone might think yeah, so. so. It's very cool. So I guess according to this one historian who's part of the actual project... These books aren't, in her opinion, it sounds like, occult books. So then the next thing I wanted to do was I wanted to contact our friend Mike, who is a Mason, who we actually consulted with when we were working on the Count of St. Germain story, and we since have stayed in touch with, and it's great because I can email him, he just writes me right back, and he's actually a Masonic historian, super well-informed. And I wanted to ask him if he felt that Masonic books could be classified as occult books. Because I was thinking about the definition, it is a secret society, to a certain extent, they do have rituals, but are they mystical? Not necessarily. And, and part of what he said, I'm going to take this a little bit out of context, but he said every book confiscated by the Nazi party in relation to Freemasonry would have been painted with the occult, mystical, subversive brush. The Nazi party wanted Freemasonry to be seen as a Jewish tool, in quotes, of control, and they pushed this agenda a tad bit smoother due to the fact that the primary allegory of craft Freemasonry is set in the world of the Old Testament, most specifically at the building of King Solomon's temple. Since Freemasonry and its rituals were then, as now, a private organization whose mysteries and privileges were open to members only, it was easy to convince the mass populace that such lies as animal sacrifice, devil worship, world bank operations, infanticide, a virginal sacrifice, etc., were most certainly the actual happenings within Masonic lodges which he then goes on to point out, is obviously completely false. He said the Nazi party rounded up many lodge membership ledgers and minutes and used these documents to round up Freemasons within Germany, France, and Poland, etc., in order to place these men in concentration camps where they were ultimately put to death. Freemasons were made to wear red triangles in prison camps. Even though the Nazi party created and promoted this propaganda, the jackboots loved themselves some magic and occult lore, so they did collect Masonic rituals and lectures in an attempt to decipher their deeper meanings, such as, they thought, a recipe for the philosopher's stone, invisibility, second sight, etc. At a recent seminar I attended on this very subject, the lead guest speaker said they found notes from some of the Nazis who attempted to decipher a great number of these confiscated texts, which showed that they eventually gave up and found the mass hoard useless. This was super fascinating. And he went on to point out that there was a, uh, all the Masonic documents that the Nazi party gathered that were actually confiscated by the Communist Party during and after World War II are just now being turned back over to their respective Grand Lodges, which is pretty fascinating. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. There's a lot of undercurrent. There's a lot of connections. So I think coming back to what Heather was saying in the Pagan blog, It was fascinating to me, the idea that this historian that she spoke to seemed to feel that the books were not occult books. So I think it's safe to say, after talking to Mike, that you might be able to say, technically, the Masonic books, and we know for a fact that part of these books, these 12,000 books that they're going through in Prague, were, I was going to say stolen, essentially they are stolen. They were taken from the Norwegian Freemasonry Lodge in Oslo. And they're attempting to get those returned to them. But those books, you can't necessarily say, I don't think, by the definition of occultism, are occult books, depending on how you feel about occult. Yes, it's a secret society. No, they aren't sacrificing babies. So the question (laughs) is, where do you come down on that? It's still strange that the Nazis were so obsessed with the Freemasons that they're taking all this stuff, they're going through it and trying to figure out how to use those rituals, understand their enemies, but also take advantage of that power, at least through Himmler's eyes. I think that's really fascinating. But here's the thing that is surprising to me about the other books in the collection, not just the Masonic ones. There's a website called Books Discovered Once Again Virtual Exhibit. It's a beautiful website, super well designed. We'll have a link to it. And it talks about this collection of books and what they are. And the very first picture on this website is a close-up of some books on a shelf. I just want to read you some of the titles from this collection of books that the woman who's working with the book says are not occult-related. One of them is called Parapsychology. The other one is called Degrees of the Zodiac. 
the other ones, I can't read all of them, but they do have a decidedly esoteric and occultish feel to me in terms of their titles. Yeah. Even taking away whatever portions of these books are pertaining to the Norwegian Freemason Lodge or whatever, these feel super occultish to me. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, maybe I'm not using the word right. So well, I'm just trying to paint the bigger picture here. It's like, is it a cult? Is it not a cult? Or is whatever. And even if you're debunking, it sounds like the historian's debunking the idea that these are occult and mystic and witchcraft books. And th that was one thing she specifically said, there's no books here on witchcraft. Yeah. Even though she's saying that and she's got the books, I'm not completely convinced. I mean, I'm seeing this book, Degrees of the Zodiac. It seems plausible that somewhere in there there's a book about witchcraft. But I'm not saying, I'm not trying to confirmation bias this book collection to fit they, I don't want to shoehorn yeah, it, right. you know. Right. We don't know. There could be up to a half a million books. Yeah, this uh, is only a small piece. It's a small fraction. And like all of history, Scott, it depends on your point of view and your agenda and your stance on it and what you choose to include and what you choose to leave out. And you were talking about that article in ancientorigins.net by Natalia Klimjak. Yes. And there's a couple of paragraphs after that you didn't mention, but that makes a, de a definite tie-in with how you present this mythology and your findings. Now, what's interesting, later on, Klimjak mentions that Himmler believed that the power of the old occult masters would help the Nazis to rule the world. He followed the witch cult hypothesis created by Margaret Murray, a famous researcher in this field. He believed in a scientific point of view on witchcraft, and with time, he became obsessed with it. He trusted that the Kelto Germanic nature religion would bring him all that he desired. But the simple version of purely traditional aspects were not enough for him. The Nazis created the dirtiest and most corrupt version of witchcraft to have ever existed. So what's interesting here is that he is borrowing on the ideas and being inspired by the ideas, the witch cult hypothesis created by Margaret Murray. Now, the little bit that I'd read on her, admittedly, I'd not read any of her books, but in her seminal books, The God of the Witches and The Witch Cult in Western Europe, A Study in Anthropology, I had read, now, don't, please don't write us any letters if I got this wrong. I'm not painting the practice of witchcraft or paganism in any light, but it is said that she downplayed the more negative aspects of witchcraft in its history in that of animal sacrifice, and child sacrifice. Right. Because, as her friends had said, she got kind of into this and maybe was following it herself, but using science and anthropology to form solid ideas. But personally, she was becoming a sort of an adherent. And they don't know, I don't think that they know personally if she was part of a 13-member coven or coven. But uh, that's, <laughs> that's from a, the, yeah. the American movie. That's a good movie. movie. Yeah, the, <laughs> classic. But... They thought that she's pushing at least knowledge and trying to bring this into the greater realm of people's knowledge. But my point here is that you still want to shade it as less negative than it may appear to some people. Because as soon as they come across, oh, you're sacrificing animals, even in the past. Yeah. And we're not saying that you all do that. And then you bring in child sacrifice, that doesn't sit well with a lot of people. So they're not going to hear you. So you shade this mythology to kind of fit your purposes. Her purposes were for education and maybe some self-practice here. Himmler's purpose was to form this idea of Aryan superiority based on these legends, and he started believing kind of his own BS here in that the Nordic Aryan races would soon rule the world as they once had in the ancient times, and that the SS were the new Teutonic Knights. Right. And as we mentioned in the Nazi Bell episode, Bevelsburg, the castle there with the black sun and the mosaic there and all yes. that kind of business, yeah. they were terming as the center of the world and a place to honor the fallen SS generals whom they considered Teutonic Knights in this new era. So talk about a whole mythology he's creating. He could be writing his own line of science fiction books. Well, and here's the other thing that's fascinating about that. Margaret Murray also is considered the grandmother of Wicca. Like oh, the, well, yeah, the, yeah. Her witch cult theory provided the blueprint, this is on Wikipedia, for yeah. the contemporary pagan religion of Wicca, and that is sourced. And the pagan studies scholar Ethan Doyle White stated that it was the theory which, quote, formed the historical narrative around which Wicca built itself. And when Wicca first emerged in the 40s and 50s in England, it claimed to be the survival of the witch cult. 
Ah, well, there you go. So, now, I don't yeah. know. I had a friend that was involved in the... Lutheran I believe church. you mentioned that before. I yes. have, yeah. and I Because I know they have a... Or did, anyway, have a strong presence in North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. But anyway, it's fascinating to me, the, the history of all of this stuff, and then Margaret Murray and how she's connected to that, and then Himmler took inspiration from her to develop his own well, thing. Well, that's... And it's just like, yeah. it's, talk about everything's connected. No, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the connecting point here is yeah. that people borrow the pieces that they want to to yes. push their own agendas. Yeah. And it's always happened, and it always will. Yeah. And to sift that out, to form your own ideas of what you should be following, you kind of have to read between the lines. And, and again, you may not know what was not included, but if you do enough research, you'll probably find out. Yeah. So pay attention, everybody. Read everything. Notice everything. Now, here's a couple of paragraphs that were included in the original article by Natalia Klimjak. Well, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm just making up my own pronunciation. Yeah, I hope you know, right. ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've stopped. Not that I don't care, but I've stopped caring. So <laughs> the point being is that I'm just, yeah, I'm just having fun with the words here. But there's two interesting things that tie it back to the castle. So don't blame us or send us letters. We're just kind of repeating. I'm just kind of reading off of the last part of her article, which I find very interesting. And she will admit here in the article that it's not believed by everybody, but yeah. it's an interesting point, And it ties it back to the castle. So where Scott left off was saying that he believed that the Catholic Church was trying to put an end to German pagan ritual and belief through their inquisition earlier and squash the Volkish movement. And so he even tried to, as Scott said before, find proof for his own magical roots. And that's where the biographers on Himmler said that he discovered one of his ancestors was burned as a witch. So for acts of, of the distant past, he grew very angry and uh, started coming out in anti-Christian propaganda. And he began to hate Christianity and believe that he owed his successes against it to the ones who were murdered for having a knowledge of magic. Now, the next paragraph in this article by Klimschak, quote, According to George Luck, the cult which Himmler followed had its roots in late antiquity. In his book, Arcana Mundi, Magic and the Occult in the Greek and Roman Worlds, he described the basis of the beliefs which became an important part of the political life of Nazis. The cult worshipped the horned god of Celts, and a Greco-Roman pan faunus. It was a combination of gods which gave roots to a new deity, an early conception of the devil. Researchers still debate about the roots of these behaviors. It is uncertain why these kinds of religious actions and collecting witchcraft and occult books became so important for the people who worked for Adolf Hitler. All of the Nazis, including the Führer, attended ceremonies of the new cult. Many of them happened in the castle Hushka. 29.2 miles north of Prague. And then it just goes on to the same descriptions of Castle Hushka, which have been going on for us for all of part one. So the idea here, which I thought was like all of the Nazis, including the Fuhrer, attended ceremonies. I'm sure there's going to be people who debate that, but it's an interesting point in that my thinking earlier was that Adolf himself was like, nah, if it works, it works. You know, yeah. He's going to show us like, hey, if it works, his end goal was to conquer at all costs. And they shared the same end goal, which was to spread the German Aryan culture throughout the world. Now, I don't know what's going to happen when they get to Asia. I believe Himmler and some other people had believed that there would be an end time war, which they would, there would be an ultimate battle against the forces of the East and the forces of the West, which they would control would be victorious. I'm not sure what happens with the Italians. Their, their allies are the Japanese. So these are big, big, crazy thoughts, but they had a lot of manpower and violence and means to enforce it and search it out and develop it. So that's what was going on, as crazy as it seems. So one thing I wanted to mention here as we wrap up the section on Nazis is that I think Marie in the Ark here found a great resource, and it seems to be a collection of five books but really what they are is research papers trying to propose a archaeological rescue of artifacts and documents that the Nazis absconded with and also possibly promote a television documentary series to document the whole thing, right. the search, which yeah. is basically collecting all of these treasures that were looted and now uh, people robbed of their culture. Try and get back to them. And it, what's interesting about this whole series of the five books is that it gets way out there. And there are ties to the Nazi bell, which got me excited. Yes. And to the same region, which I kind of mentioned earlier, but it, it kind of touches on that. So we'll have a link to that. Now, it may not be totally downloadable, but it was published in 2005, I believe, by Yaroslav 
Svecheni, the Czech. Uh, he's nice a, work. Oh, thank you very much. So he's a Czech Republic researcher, television producer, I believe, and book writer. But it's pretty interesting. And then posthumously, this was posted online by a friend of his who's also a French TV reporter, documentary film director, filmmaker, and researcher. He just goes by PAT. So he's doing it. He posted that in 2011 as kind of a, a historical account honoring his friend for doing a tremendous amount of research on this. And he passed away, I believe, before anything really happened with it. So he's trying to keep it alive online. Right. So I applaud that. It's fascinating whether you believe any of it at all. It is a fascinating look at this whole area. And it sums up a lot of things we've already mentioned. So we've been pulling from different sources, but it kind of, it's an encapsulation. So now book three of this specifically deals with the castles in Bohemia and also codenamed Burgund 1 through 4, Burgund 2 being Huska. Huska. Yes. There's an interesting point though. Now I'm not going to read, we've already summed a lot of this up. So what I will do in conclusion here is that he does come back to an interesting point about what we were talking about earlier, as far as definitely there seems to be a lot of evidence, much of it irrefutable, about the Nazis stashing, let's just say strange books on uh, yes. very esoteric, that's a broader, more gentler term, esoteric subjects, okay? Not just poor Richard's almanac. And, yeah. And lots of different books that dealt with kind of archaic subjects and magic. And hey, you dig through those, maybe you find a, uh, an old grimoire. It's something to like, hey, we found an access to the underworld. We can summon the devil and he'll win the war for us because he's on our side. Yeah. They're looking for everything. That's my point. They're not going to leave any stone unturned. And their sense of what is occulted science, as mentioned in, here in this paper towards the end of this, of this one chapter on called Section 38, Nazi Occult Workshop, which he believes Castle Hauska was. The idea here is that the Nazis really, with Anan Erbe, the project to find all the stuff, their angle was science, really, and militarization as an end goal, not just dancing around telling stories around the fire here. They called it occulted science, and so it understood by the Nazis as having power, different artifacts, but ancient mysteries, esoteric and occult traditions. It could be physical, it could be metaphysical, but they wanted to apply a science to this for their own use. And it focused, in their sense of occulted science, on three general areas of physics, chemistry, and biology. And the occulted aspect of the term occulted science would, in their sense, mean just hidden or dark, and therefore dark also meaning black ops and covert, top secret, Krieg and Scheidend, as we said with the Nazi bell, war decisive. So if they could figure out, hey, you don't have to build a, uh, you know, if you could put a hex on somebody, murder them from a distance, talking about men staring at goats here kind of stuff. Yeah. You don't need to build a V3 rocket that can reach uh, from Berlin all the way to London. Right. Which, Same thing you know, if you can on that. bend yeah. space and time with the Nazi bell. Exactly. So know. that's kind of the idea, right? What's We need every advantage. What can we do here? So the SS's idea of occult research is widely encompassing and largely based on trying to, again, mine this for its scientific value and weaponization properties. Okay, so one last thing here is the guy who is running this office here of uh, Bergen II, codename for Castle Huska, Ernst Schombacher. Who lived from 1899 to 1945. So then at the 40, age of 46 here at the close of the war. Yes, commit suicide. Yeah. We don't know what prompted him to do that. Maybe he saw the Allies coming, and a lot of those guys did that. Certainly Himmler took that route of suicide while he was captured by the British. So it's hard to say, but this place, is, again, has no doubt seen its uh, share of tragedy, including the three soldiers that apparently is, we've not countered any uh, resistance to this statement that they did unearth three German soldiers that looked to have been executed. Yes, inside right? the castle. Inside the castle that yeah. were just buried in the floor. So yeah. anytime you bury somebody right on the property, yeah, right in the gift shop, yeah, <laughs> you're asking for a haunting. Yeah. It's just bad mojo and bad manners, really. But one thing we wanted to point out that you might find in the Wikipedia entry, actually you will, <laughs> for, yeah, for the castle. At least as of right now, it's there. At least, yes. And not that we're trying to make this a trend, but we found something else that may not be totally accurate. But it is perhaps one of the more interesting things you'll find in there. In the history section on the Wikipedia entry. For Hoska. Uh, for Hoska. The last line in the history section, after talking about during the times of the First Republic of Czechoslovakia, at that time, now Czech Republic, it was bought by the president of Skoda Motors, now owned by VW, we believe. 
and currently owned by the great grandson of Yosef Simonek. So, yeah, and I believe I just said the grandson. In yeah, part we one, were, but he's the great grandson. Exactly, yeah. we were close. Yeah, one uh, generation. So here's the last sentence of that, which I found like, ooh, this is intriguing and scary and good for the Halloween season. We got to look into this. Last sentence says, during World War II, the Germans used the castle to perform inhumane experiments on local people or prisoners of war. And then it lists a citation, which you go down here to the bottom, and it is the book Wonders of Bohemia, Moravia, and Silesia by Peter David or David Vladimir Sukup. Lubomir Chich. And it is a fantastic coffee table book. Uh, it is. That's the one we were talking about. It was on order. Last we like, week, yeah, we last ordered week. it. Like, and I, I yeah. bought it through Amazon, used copy. There were only two for sale yeah. from two different suppliers. I emailed them, you know, after I placed the order. I was like, please rush this. <laughs> There's, so they, there is very juicy, creepy movie Nazi stuff experiments going yeah, on. Yeah, we want to yeah. hear about it relating to Castle Hoska. And this book People is People being fabulous. thrown into portals and weird, uh, horrible experiments being done. Yes, and, and the book is great. It has like 100 plus castles in it. It's just amazing. It's in depth. It's got beautiful pictures. Yeah, there, it's not that expensive. Uh, yeah. About 11 bucks, maybe? Seven it wasn't even, no, I got it for the price of shipping. Oh, there you go. It was a used copy, and I got it for the price of shipping. But here's the other thing that's not in there. (laughs) Yeah. For all the castles that are in there, it doesn't even have a section on Hoska. It has a sidebar on Hoska on the page of another castle. And in that sidebar, there is no mention of Nazi experiments. Uh, And I want to say, unfortunately, but I never like to hear about Nazi experiments. We're certainly not excited or or proud about that. But it's it's a creepy thing. And if it's happening, I wanted to know about it. Yeah, we wanted to know if we could source it. Yeah. And so on page 80, which is what the reference is on the Wikipedia entry... It's page 80. And again, yeah, you go to page 80, and there is, as Scott said, on the left side here is Magical Hushka Castle. And actually, the main castle featured was actually pretty cool, too, is Kokoren Castle. But that's it. Just talks about the same things we mentioned, and obviously, whoever wrote the entry pulled all this stuff and put it into the the Wikipedia entry. And so they got a lot of it from the sidebar, which I trust these guys because they're Czech. So they they went around all their, their own country, And looked at all the landmarks, and it's, again, just gorgeous photography. Yes. It's really fascinating. Again, it's a a beautiful and fascinating country. And it comes with a satin bookmark that you can put in and to hold your place here. It's very nice. Yeah, but you just didn't find any evidence of... Yeah, the overarching point is, yet again, we're (laughs) at where we're with a Wikipedia entry that is citing something that there's absolutely no mention of in the actual text. No, so again, I'm not sure the reason. It it could be, again, a simple mistake as... uh, Miscitation. Just a miscitation. It's not anything nefarious. And and to be fair, there's another source cited. Do you have the Wikipedia page open? I do, yeah. What's that other source? I could not get my hands on that other one. And it's in check, I believe. It is in check. And we had a listener actually point us to this. And it's somebody who is knowledgeable about Czech castles. And it's Tomasz Dordik. And again, this is in Czech. So it's like Encyclopedia Czechish Hradu, which Hrad is Czech for castle. Right. So basically, it's the Encyclopedia of Czech castles. I didn't even look that up. I'm just <laughs> flying. Yes. Just flying, flying blind, blind here. Yeah. But I've been looking at so much Czech lately. I'm just gonna, I'm going to put my uh, yes. money down on that one. So that's it. Tomasz Dordik. So it may be in there, but you know what? It's really, I think that focus is not in so much the esoteric, creepy crap that we do. It's really about the architecture and the, the historical aspects of these castles, Hushka being one of them. So maybe it's in there. Right. I don't have See, time the to, only, uh, yeah. yeah, the only thing we can, yeah, possibly speculate is if that you the get, Nazi experiments are right. attributed to the Encyclopedia of Czech Castles, which we could not get our hands on and miscited to have become from the other book that we did get, which it's clearly not in. Yeah, you'll you'll see that if you look that up, but it's a pages, uh, pages 104 to 105. You're not going to get this book, folks. It's just, you know, yeah. Unless you speak Czech and you already own it. Reference number three is, I believe that, uh, I haven't checked that lately, but I believe that goes to a French ghost paranormal documentary team that goes and investigates things like that. And it's in French. So it's yeah. lovely to hear. I like to put it in the background just to, as they work because it's spooky, but it's in French, so you can concentrate. But maybe there's more information there that they found something of the local history. But kind of going back to what uh, Travis Dow was telling us is that even the local historians there, it's like, you kind of, there's an agenda there. Maybe they're trying to make it a little more spooky than it actually is. Well, and to that point, I meant to mention this earlier, and I don't know if I did, but there's the room that I asked him about in the interview, Satan's Office, yeah. which they show on the Ghost Hunters International show. With, with Satan's Office chair. Yeah, yeah, has a chair in it that's real sort of gothic looking with 
different iron things mm, slapped together. Yeah. But yeah, and I had suspected when I watched Ghost Hunters International, <laughs> yeah, that that chair was a modern creation. And I did ask Hannah McGee about it at McGee's Ghost Tours, and she did say. That's made up. That <laughs> there are aspects to the story that obviously are to, to draw tourism and all of that kind of thing. But as I said when I was talking to Travis, she also said, but the hellhole is real. She believed it. She yeah. believed in the uh, creepiness of it. And that's my point is that, yes, it's something to look at. It's really something to take pictures of. But from what we've heard from people, well, Travis and, and other descriptions we've read, if you go down in there, it is creepy alone. Yeah. It's just now got some props in it. Again, that goes to the personal thing that, you know, it's not like a, a haunted house where the chair comes alive and reaches out for you or somebody jumps out from a corner. You don't really need that. It's got resonant evil creepiness to it. We'll try and have more pictures. We've been trying to struggle with finding um, Creative Commons ones, which we can feature without upsetting people. But it's a creepy dungeony kind of room that I'm sure if you're in there, like Travis said, uh, late at night, three in the morning, you don't want to be in there anyway. Yeah. That and the attic. So I attics, basements, cellars dungeons, places of possible torture, you don't want to be in late at night by yourself. And what I'll say, kind of wrapping up the whole Nazi thing here, is that from what you've known of other actions or read about when it comes to the German secret police, the state police of the Gestapo, and uh, the intelligence services here, if there's somebody in town that they think is maybe got some knowledge, maybe got a, a tip or a bit of info or maybe there's somebody that uh, is getting rendered to an out-of-the-way place that they need some information from. I don't really put it past the Nazis to do a little torture yeah. to get it out of them. Yeah. Or just for fun. So I doubt that there's like a Jacob's Ladder with the lightning bolts and they're, they're creating a Frankenstein in there. That's doubtful. But weird cultish kind of ceremonies going on, definitely I think that's possible. And possibly some really horrible interrogation. Moving on, or moving in, or maybe moving down. We, yeah. We, I oh, wanna, good, good one. Yeah. yeah, I want to talk a little bit about other hell holes in the world, of which there are plenty. There's one that we actually even have mentioned on the show in the past, sort of jokingly. It's a running gag. Yeah, Mel's Hole, which <laughs> it's, it's kind of sounds name like it's funny. It kind of sounds like an unfortunately named cafe. Yes, or Roadhouse Cafe. Mel's yeah. Hole, which was this hole. They even talked about it on Coast to Coast, I believe. Well, that's where the legend started. Yeah. yeah. That's right here in the good old United States. It is, and you're going to tease me about this, but it is kind of in that area that I am uh, possibly from, but Regionally. much further west. It's somewhere near, supposedly, Ellensburg, Washington, which is kind of in the center of the Washington state. I believe if you ever take the bus, the Greyhound, you'll pass through it. That and uh, George Washington, where the, where the gorge is, kind of around there, where there, there's great concerts now. Oh. But if you ever took the bus, like going to Seattle, it was just a place to get a sandwich and use the restroom. So uh, Mel's Hole is really kind of an urban legend. And I think the first claims were made on coast to coast by somebody calling in, calling himself Mel Waters, and talking about like this bottomless pit. He's tried to measure it. I'm just kind of going off the top of my head here because it was such a running thing that we kind of, every few months, Scott and I would look this up like, yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. But there's all kinds of- uh, Ain't that something. Yeah, ain't that something. I wonder if that's real. And I think I mentioned this last time, uh, Gerald R. Osborne, I believe he claims he's half Native American, half uh, white man, goes by the name of Red Elk, actually tried to take people there and claims to have To Mel's Hole. Yes, to Mel's Hole, claims to have knowledge of it, and uh, with like 30 people with an expedition here, and he couldn't find it. So don't know what that was about, but the lore about it is a lot like what you hear with Hauskas. And I don't know if this Mel Waters, if that's where he found it and started talking about this stuff, or if it's just part of the natural lore of bottomless pits and what people expect to find, because what I had read a long time before was that Strange creatures were being hauled up. Gelatinous, translucent kind of blob <laughs> creatures that were like gummy things that were um, sentient. Kind of like Mothman were communicating a sense of sadness. Yes. And uh, they lured a sheep down to see what happened. It came up toasty and fried and smoking. Right. Do you see the pattern here, folks? Yeah. The things that go down don't suffer very well. The things that come up are creepy and weird and sad. No murders, not like the horrible things coming, supposedly coming out of the hellhole at Huska, but 
certainly the same story patterns you're seeing over and over again. So people have asked us, they, a few people have written in, it's like, what was that thing you're talking about? And it's like Mel's Hole and a lot of similarities there. So again, Hushka is kind of, it's not a very well-known story unless you're from that region or you've, you've just read up on Czech castles, Hrads. So maybe that's where this person got it, thinking like, well, that's a good pattern. Or again, it could be just organic and that's how humans perceive deep, dark, bottomless pits. Yeah, because Mel's Hole has been, mm. I think it's been fully debunked, but I'm not positive. Well, that nobody can find a guy named Mel Waters uh, yeah. owning property and then in Red Elk County. couldn't get anybody to it, right? Yeah. Right. There's local news reporters who have uh, tried to look into it, and it's just too vague. And of yeah. course, Mel saying, well, the government came in and bought, it uh, you know, bought him out, fenced the whole thing up. You can't get in there. And Mel moved to Australia with the money they gave him. Mm-hmm. for a eminent domain. <laughs> what are Conveniently this? far away. But what does that sound like? What do you believe in happening in Ute country? Skinwalker. Exactly. Yeah. Now, but the, you seem to think that there's more credibility to that, actually, because there are, well, Robert Bigelow actually had ownership of the place. And so, well, yes. So well, we've and, had yeah. multiple reports from different sources that the right. U.S. government has purchased Skinwalker Ranch. And then from an additional source, a friend of the show, somebody we know personally, yeah. has indicated that the land around the ranch is being purchased and ranchers who won't sell are being harassed by the government to sell by exactly. uh, using red tape and right. bureaucracy. Yeah, so you're, they're hassling them out. Yeah. But that is more trackable, and there's land records and, yeah. and deeds and all that. So this one, not so much, but it's a fun tale. Yeah, it's good. So, so what else have you, you got? Well, there's a couple of other ones. I mean, there's a lot of them. Uh, they, there was a list that I think Cogswell found, Chris Cogswell, yeah. and uh, Dr. Chris Cogswell, I should say. And Doc the, Cogs. Uh, Astonishing Research Corps that Atlas Obscura did. 11 Hidden Spots to Enter the Underworld, which is fascinating. But I, mm-hmm. I just picked a few off of here. One of them was the Cave of the Sibyl. And this one's going to come up. It's a very fascinating. A Sibyl is is like an oracle. That's somebody who can Like predict. the oracle at Delphi. Yes, you know. like the oracle at Delphi. And we're going to talk a little bit about how that works. And uh, quoting from that particular listing, the Cumaean Sibyl was an oracle, a fortune teller and priestess who sung prophecies echoed endlessly around the hollow caverns. At the age of seven, 700, she served as a guide to Aeneas as he descended through the caves to the hell below. Now, the idea of going to hell, crossing the River Styx, entering these caves, it's going to lead us to a final discussion here on Hoska and the possibility of what might be going on there. Another one I wanted to mention was the, I just didn't even look this up, so good luck if you live in Belize, uh, I apologize. There is a cave in the Taper Mountain Nature Reserve, could be Tapir, Tapir, Taper, called the Acton Tunichul Muknal Cave. Maybe it's Muknal. This cave is also called the Cave of the Crystal Sepulcher. It is Mayan in origin, and this is a huge subterranean maze of caverns and that has all these twists and turns, including one room with a ton of stalactites called the Cathedral, I believe. And it was thought to have been ruled by the Mayan death gods, the Lords of Zabalba. And these caves are actually were only, I guess they were rediscovered in 1989. It's one of those things where they found them and then maybe forgot about them. But one of the things that's really fascinating is Inside the cave, there is a calcified, sparkling 1,000-year-old skeleton of an 18-year-old girl who was thought to have possibly been ritualistically sacrificed. She is known as the Crystal Maiden. And there's a picture of her. We have a picture. We have a link to uh, this listing and a picture of her. And she's a mummy. Uh, she's Well, she's a skeleton. But oh, she, right. Oh, so there's no, uh, no, yeah, there's there's no, no flesh. No, yeah. there's no flesh, but it's calcified. So it's like she almost looks like a geode skeleton, like yeah, sparkly. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. Wow. So I guess historians apparently think that many of the remains in there might be, maybe instead of sacrifices, they might have been persons suspected of witchcraft or suffering from ailments they couldn't understand, uh, in which case they were killed and sealed inside this Mayan gateway to hell. But let's come back to Pluto's Gate, which is a site dedicated to the god Pluto, ruler of the underworld, Pluto being a later and less frightening name than he was first known as, Hades. Mm. Pluto's Gate was thought to be fictional, because it had been written about, until it was discovered in 1965, and then it was explored again in 2013. Now, the guy that found it in 1965 was actually an amateur archaeologist. And in 2013, it was more officially explored. No one knows how old it is, 
but it's near the city of Heropolis, which is uh, real close by, which was founded in 190 BC. Now, the interesting thing about this cave is they can tell that ritualistic animal sacrifices had been made there. Birds flying into this cave for warmth will fall dead almost instantaneously. It's not as big as some caves, but it's several thousand square feet. There's an entrance area. And what used to happen was the priests would sell birds to visitors when they came down there, and there was also an oracle there. Now, all this stuff represented income for the temple that was there, and there was a lot of hot water and noxious gases. And the Greeks thought that when people died in the cave, it was because the poisoned air had been sent there by Pluto. Now, one of the ways that the priests confirmed that they had divine protection was they would prove that they could go into the cave and return alive. But apparently, this Greek philosopher and author named Strabo concluded that what these guys were doing to go in and come out alive was they had figured out where the poisonous gases were pocketing. And, well, that's a lot of dangerous trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and holding your breath and moving yeah. to this area of clean air. And so you could go in, hold your breath, and come out, and poof, look, I'm alive. And you need to believe that I'm divine. Yeah. And, well, you heard the term canary in a coal mine, right? Yeah. Birds are very susceptible to gases, and they actually brought canaries in there. And, and uh, if they conked out, you knew that something bad was there before even humans could smell it. Yeah. Here's from the Greek philosopher Strabo's famous 17-book series, Geographica. Here's a quote from that. And it's translated, so it's going to sound a little strange, but... This space is full of a vapor so misty and dense that one can scarcely see the ground. Now, to those who approach the handrail anywhere around the enclosure, the air is harmless, since the outside is free from that vapor in calm weather. For the vapor then stays inside the enclosure, but any animal that passes inside meets instant death. At any rate, bulls that are led into it fall and are dragged out dead. And I threw in sparrows, and they immediately breathed their last and fell. But the galley, who are eunuchs, pass inside with such impunity that they even approach the opening, bend over it, and descend into it to a certain depth, though they hold their breath as much as they can, for I could see in their countenances an indication of a kind of suffocating attack, as it were. Whether this immunity belongs to all who are maimed in this way or only to those round the temple or whether it's because of divine providence as would be likely in the case of divine obsessions or whether it is the result of a certain physical powers that are antidotes against the vapor. Anyway, what he, he was speculating that there was maybe some tricky business going on, it sounds like to me, about how people were surviving the poisonous gases. But what's interesting about this in the research that we did as it pertains to a lot of these caves, and this is something that came up in the research core as well, is that the Oracle of Delphi and the Sibyls and all these guys that are making predictions are... Loopy on gas. Loopy on gas. Because the other suggestion here was that at the cave of the Sibyl, that it was possible that people would come down and they would be led in and the gas would make them loopy, it was almost like a weird carnival where they would take them down, they would have these gases, and then there would be these hot streams, and they would make them think that they were at the River Styx, and it was a whole experience that they were having. Yeah. And in exchange for money or respect for divinity or whatever else you want to think. And that is really fascinating. And that comes back around to the gas, toxic gas situation, which was something that we wanted to look into as a plausible source for some of the goings on at <laughs> right at Hoska Castle, yeah. where the fissure was before the chasm before they blocked it up. So really, it's like an ancient Greek way to get a buzz and uh, give some coins to the leader of the group who would take you into the cave. Yeah. You get some capital for divinity by surviving the trip or being uh, an usher across the River Styx or to the River Styx or to the underworld or here, look at this, you're standing in hell, Yeah, but we better go before you actually (laughs) die. Well, that brings us to another big point and theory that, of course, a lot of people have been thinking about and maybe what's going on is some gases coming up from the ground that are causing people to hallucinate. Now, in your ancient story here, we don't know what gases those are, but certainly you can tell by how long people lived in the various concentrations. From the very cursory research that I did on some of gases, sulfur dioxide, we've got your nitrous oxide, that would be the fun party gas yeah. that you get, you get at the dentist, Or it could be methane, that's a natural gas that sometimes emanates from the ground, or your local animal pen. Or radon, now that's a radioactive substance, a noble gas, 
And they all have their different properties. Even carbogen, which is a mixture of carbon dioxide and O2, and it has been used in psychedelic psychotherapy. So that's interesting, is that that can induce a psychotropic state, perhaps, or a hallucination, kind of like, you know, you heard that LSD therapy back in the day, and, and people are getting into it again as a way of treatment. But I don't know about the ancient Greeks, but with Hushka, back before it was covered, yeah, it could make you loopy, but if it's that concentrated coming out of the ground, you weren't going to live very long. Certainly with sulfur dioxide, people had made a connection to Oak Island. And perhaps there was some theory that, okay, they were using a pump and maybe the carbon monoxide poisoning caused them to fall, you know, the, the father and son, it was very tragic. And that led to that theory that seven must die. Mm-hmm. Here's where we had our theory is that, yeah, carbon monoxide poisoning certainly is deadly. I'm talking right off the top of my head here. <laughs> As I had learned it previously, what you have with carbon monoxide is the single oxygen atom. It looks to find another oxygen atom to form carbon dioxide. So basically what's happening in your lungs when you breathe that in is you you start to asphyxiate. Yes. But it's kind of a slower process. You'll have other symptoms like, yeah, you could start to hallucinate eventually, but you'll most likely start to just lose consciousness. If you somehow get fresh air or the amount dissipates, you'll have a tremendous headache, tons of other side effects. But unlike the guy lowered down into the pit because that was one idea, it's like, well, maybe he got a blast of gas And that's what made him raving and screaming and claiming to see, well, horrible smell. Certainly that could be sulfurous. Yes. But the other stuff where he's super animated and screaming and tearing out to get loose, that does not sound like the other gas poisonings. If you look at Oak Island, it was so tragic in that people immediately died within seconds. Yeah. People who went in after them died within seconds. And also, we should talk about with regard to that guy that was lowered into the pit, also the story that his hair turned white. And and it's lore, it's legend. I had asked the Astonishing Research Corps about that, the idea, is there anything that can do that, chemicals or that could suddenly do that? Because there was some suggestion that the appearance of hair turning white was because other hair fell out, the white hair was already there, and then this other hair fell out due to stress or something. There is no reason scientific reason, apparently, that hair should turn white that quickly. But we did find Quaid Joslin, who is in the Astonishing Research Corps, said the following about this. He had found an interesting article about sudden hair pigment loss and how it can or can't work. And he's quoting the article here. Canitis subita is the medical term for hair turning white overnight. The phenomenon is almost universally acknowledged as myth, but not entirely. A 2013 study in the International Journal of Trichology found 84 reports of, quote, unusually rapid, end quote, adult hair blanching in medical literature between 1800 and the present day. Of these, 14 were witnessed by a physician and were not explained by the rate of follicle growth or any known medical conditions. That's actually from a BBC article, which we'll have a link to. Anyway, so that's pretty fascinating. The other thing it's I do not want, impossible. That's it's not I, impossible. I love that. Yes, it's, right. we've got witnesses. I also wanted to mention that obviously one of the first things you think when you think about the black winged creatures, yeah. maybe they were bats, yeah. large bats. Maybe people didn't understand. I did ask Cogs if he thought the bats could live in the cave that also had poisonous gases, and he said sure because the gases are different densities. You could have pockets with poisonous gases, and you could have plenty of safe areas for the bats to live. So maybe the poisonous gases are coming out. And bats are flying around and people are hallucinating, but... Bats being the owl's answer for the middle, middle ages. Yeah, yeah. well, I well, mean, no, this kidding, is... But no, yes. but you're right. And this is, is pre-really recorded history. We don't have a lot of documentation. We don't even know how the crack formed. If the crack formed in the case of an earthquake... That's the only thing it could be, really. Yeah. Or it could be gravity if the if the rock just cracked because the cliff is falling apart or something. I believe that, erosion, yes. Yeah. So yeah, what Cogs was saying exactly. is basically limestone being eaten away by moisture. Now, not right. to say that there's a well there. I'm not getting into the water debate, but, yeah. but something's eroding that. So under its own weight, it forms a cave or a giant fissure. Right. Now, and if it does that, though, it's going to have, theoretically, if it's not on a caldera, or part of a volcano right. or some kind of pre-existing system, it's going to have a finite amount of gas in it that's yeah. going to come out when it opens up and then is going to be gone. Unless that's you've got my, something yes. down there that is continuously producing the gas, right. 
in which case it has to be above a volcano or something like that, which is absolutely not the case here. We would know that. Yeah. And then so, I would say that'd be more on the sulfur dioxide. Which is what they attribute some of the gases that oracles and sibyls were being exposed to. Sure. It's related to... Yeah, but I would say that that really shortens your life as well. It's like even with radon that it'll give you cancer, lung cancer in some right. cases. And so... Which is why when you buy a house in the United States, by you do state a radon law, test, you yeah. have to do a radon test. Yeah. Now, here's my point, though. There's a difference between a six foot long bat and a regular bat. We've all yeah. seen tiny bats flying around and uh, they're kind of cool, a little creepy, but people do it regularly and they help the environment by eating lots of mosquitoes. Well, once again, you wouldn't think that people in these time periods would be completely unaware what a bat looked like. Exactly. And my other point was that those sightings, I believe, at least the legend part that I had read, happened once it had already been covered over with giant slabs of stone. So it's not like a gaping hole and then people are seeing these dementors. Yes. The stories that I had read were that they were seeing these things flying over the courtyard of the already built portion of the castle uh, courtyard there. And so it's basically already sealed. And the other thing is that, yes, gases can make people hallucinate, but all hallucinate the same things. Maybe that's, you would say, power of suggestion. But uh, again, it's like we're going back to owls and goblins. They're all hallucinating the same thing at the same time. Doesn't so, seem likely. Yeah, it doesn't seem likely. And so my vote here on uh, noxious gases is that, yeah, definitely possible. Like everything else, may account for portions of these legendary you know, descriptions and sightings and the legends here. But it doesn't seem likely that it would account for the hundreds of years of weird sightings that people are seeing. So here's something interesting as we kind of wrap up part two of Castle Talk here. This idea of a portal or doorway to hell, certainly not new. In fact, from the beginning of uh, recorded history, as much as we know, I'm sure way into caveman times, there's an idea that there is a beyond and that there is a boundary between that or a partition between this world and the next. So here's something fascinating that I found during my research, actually for The Great Courses Plus, terrific resource. Man, I wish I had more time to look at everything, everything they offer, all 8,000 lectures. Yeah. But this one that we were talking about before called The Mysterious Etruscans, taught by Professor Stephen L. Tuck, was fascinating because he does talk about the Etruscan afterlife, which actually influenced all of the Romans and their rituals. And we talked a little bit about this, but in the lecture series, Etruscan Afterlife, he talks about all we have to go on are funerary art that's left as frescoes and paintings and some mosaics, I believe, in some tombs and some uh, public areas that depict it. And so, of course, historians and archaeologists and anthropologists have been able to piece together what Etruscan life was like. So for the Etruscans, their belief in the afterlife is that there could be a portal, like the River Styx or the hippocampus that takes you across the sea to another land, and there's a land journey. The belief is that you have a guide for the Etruscans, and the guide is called Banth, and it is a beautiful winged female figure, a minor deity. And I'm kind of reading from and paraphrasing Professor Tuck's uh, lecture here, because, of course, he knows much more about this than I do. But they're practically dressed for this journey, Vanth is, and that she's wearing traveling boots, she's got a short tunic, and she's ready for adventure, and she carries a torch to light the way for the souls to get into the afterlife. In some of the funerary art, she stands beside a door or a barrier between this world and the next. Other examples, she's right there at the moment of death, ready to take the dying person by the hand and lead them into the afterlife. So she's a, she's a nice, good presence. Wow, which is a very common image with uh, Richard Haddam's favorite topic, near-death experience. Ex well, again, if you ask some of my relatives as they were passing away, it's other relatives who have passed on before them, which yeah. I find comforting, yeah. I gotta say. Maybe it's just your brain misfiring at the end of life. But in the Etruscan legends there, you have this beautiful goddess. It's like, come on, I'll show you the way. I got your back here. Come with me. And she's been compared to the Norse Valkyries who escort the slain heroes to the afterlife. But you got to be really a hero to get that kind of treatment, I believe, in the Norse mythology. But here, she's ready to go with anybody, the common person to the hero. Now, this changes, and here's kind of where it gets interesting and more ties into what's been described being seen at Huska. Well, actually, it's supposed to be Hoska, but you've been Hoska. saying Huska so much, I decided yeah. to stop correcting <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it both ways, so Hoska, people get right Hoska, in. It's Hoska. like, you didn't know, I said it both ways. Yeah. So you pick the one you want. Yeah. So I'm just going to keep doing that. I think it's fine. Okay. So around the 4th century BC, 
the funerary art changes. It gets gloomier, and you start seeing some different characters come in that aren't so beautiful and helpful. Now, there's some bad times ahead. The Thirty Years' War, before that, lots of bloodshed going on. So then the Etruscans, with the change around the 4th BC and onward, now you start seeing another character called Karu, or Keru. And he is waiting by the door with Vance. He's also uh, winged. He's got a short tunic. But unlike Vanth, he is not benign. He usually carries a very large hammer. His face is grotesque. He's got a large hooked nose and a twisted mouth, scraggly beard sometimes. And he's got like a contorted face. And usually his skin is also a sickly blue or greenish gray. What's interesting here now is that as the times get worse for the Etruscans, basically losing their culture, losing wars, and times are bad, you see that reflected in their legends. And we don't know if Keru is there to beat people back from getting through the door, because this is the other thing. Heroes would go there. You could go to the underworld and come back again if right. you were clever, like the caves. Yeah. But usually you had to be a hero to do that. Right. We don't know if this figure, Karu, is there to keep people out or to keep the beasts from the underworld from entering our world. So yeah. there's horrible things on the other side that you need this demigod to keep from entering, and he's got to use a large hammer to fight them back. And so here's another terrifying demon called Takulka. He's got wings. He's basically a, a demon of sorts, and uh, he's been found in a tomb dated to about 300 BC where he's terrorizing the Greek heroes Theseus and Herethus. Now we're seeing imagery where there's a lot of combining of human and animal form or two different animals or simply appearing as misshapen hybrid animals. Now, where does that sound familiar? That's what's being described coming out of the hole. Yeah. At Hushka. There Hushka. You go. Yeah. I'll just say it in both ways yeah. each time now. I found this very interesting though, because these are mythical visions a thousand years before what we're seeing at Hauska. Again, it's the chicken and egg thing. Is it timeless? Are these just images that human beings are preloaded, like the Samsung phone that you bought, and uh, it's already got Avatar loaded on it? Yeah. And you don't want it in there because it's taking up four gigs. <laughs> Is it something that we're just preloaded with? Are these creatures and phantoms that have been described by humanity since probably the beginning of mankind just archetypes filed away in our brains, brought out under special circumstances? Or could Hoska actually be a portal from which these nightmares come? <laughs> That's going to wrap up our series on Castle Hauska, Gateway to Hell, our unofficial beginning to the Halloween season. We'll be back in two weeks with the first of four shows in a row, presented in stereo for our favorite month of the year, October. Special thanks to Travis Dow and also the members of the ARC. Please remember to support our sponsors, check out our online store for the Astonishing Coffee Mug 2.0, get books in our bookstore, buy our ringtone, join our Facebook group, and visit our Patreon page. Special thanks to John Bolin. Hi, I'm Robin Peacock. I'm Brock Randolph. And, and I, I give permission, permission to Astonishing Legends, Legends to use my voice however, however they see fit, fit galaxy-wide, in perpetuity. Our show is edited by Sarah Voorhees Wendell, and the theme is by Judson Crane. Sound design is by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to The Ark and its lead researcher, Tess Feifel. But most importantly, we want to thank our listeners. You can find us online at astonishinglegends.com, as well as Facebook, Patreon, Twitter, and Instagram. Copyright Scott Philbrook and Forrest Burgess. Good night. <laughs>